thank you so much. Um, because we're on the record, you need to say your name. Um, and the folks who are with you, um, look to me before you speak, okay? And you too will have to say your name on the record. Thanks. Go ahead. I am Catherine Thomas. I'm from Twin Valley Middle High School. I'm Jaden Copperthay. I'm from BUHS Bravo Union High School. I'm filling in for Amanda Uvino. Okay. That is Sawyer, that is Sawyer King. Uh, she is also from Twin Valley. And Shirley, would you like to? And I'm Shirley Park, their advisor. Okay, okay, great. Um, we're here today as members of Our Voice Exposed. It is a youth-led movement across Vermont, um, and we work together with VCAT through the Counterbalance Campaign, um, working to reduce the effects, well, more like prevention for teenagers. Um, <coughs> nicotine is addictive and can affect the brain development and it is found in tobacco, which can cause cancer, heart disease, and lung disease. And a lot of children don't think of that when they do these things. Um, something that I've seen within my community is the mental health issues that have led to the vulnerability and caused children to want to start. They think that it's gonna make them less stressed, when in reality, the withdrawals are making them more stressed. And even some of my friends, people that I really care about who struggle with mental health, have turned to nicotine to try to save themselves. I'm gonna say some facts about nicotine and how it all works and just what it does. On um, a young age, exposure to nicotine can cause a severe dependency when you get older and just, you would escalate to cigarettes, cigars, and just smoking. And doing it from a young age and just doing it in general can cause long-term health effects. And the long-term health effects of vaping are still unknown today. The, the, the flavorings, the like flavoring like candy is what draws the children in. Like, like elementary school kids, if the older one, if, Say an unresponsible high schooler offers a bubblegum flavored e-cigarette to a um, kindergartner. They're not going to know anything about it except for that it's bubblegum flavored and they like it. And the popular um, e-cigarette brands are like Surian, Blue, and v Fuse. And I know that f I don't know about the other first two, but I know that a Fuse is like a, a so it was one that sells the pods for um, Julian. And what I've seen. Um, I see in my school a lot of kids selling it, like in class, and just vaping in class, doing it in their sleeve, and just passing it under tables and all that, just using the same jewel pot sometimes. And she saw some photos of hidden, like jewel pods that are hidden. Like freshman year, I was curious at how many different kinds of jewel pods there were, and I found this um, vape pen last year. And it's a pen that it works as a pen, normal pen, but it's also you can vape through it. Mm -hmm. And she found this clothing line that is oh, it's, called, it's called vaporware, and it's for hiding jeweling. And they have it right yeah. here. They have it in this. And they have it in the string right here. So it looks like you're just chewing on your string, when then you can vape it back into your sleeve. And I internet king goes yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And I feel like we should change how, like a lot of how, who can buy it, where they can buy it from. Like not every gas station should have it. I feel like it's just easier to steer it off the spinning racks to keep it on. They should keep it in only e-cigarette stores and just, they, they should only keep it there. And the age restriction should be, should be better. So a more mature audience can only get it. So they don't have the, so they don't pass it on to the younger people. Cause the more mature they are, the less they're likely they're able to do that and just, how they can get it, it's just what they should do. And they should, we should make laws on how they can look. We should make laws on how they cannot look like a pen, they, how they cannot be hidden. They have to be easy, visible, and not, and all that, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's speak anymore. Yeah, your turn. Um, 
It is actually not my turn. Oh, it's my turn again. <laughs> <laughs> Section three is you. <laughs> I'm okay. So I'm going to talk about Jewel Pod specifically. So Jewel was launched in 2015, and it's a lot of high schoolers like it the best because it looks like a USB drive. They can just like that without hidden. It's so small you can just hide it in their hand, and they can go back into their sleeve. I've seen it plenty of times in my classes that happen like that. There's a lot of nicotine in uh, one pod of a Jewel. It's around the same amount as, is it a 15? If it's a fi I think it's a 15% Jewel pod can, is the same amount as nicotine as a cigarette can be. And Jewel pods are like this big. Yeah. So it's all, all of that in that tiny little pod. That's what, yeah, it's just... Oh, okay, now it's my turn. <laughs> um, Jewel still come in flavors like mint and menthol, and menthol specifically can kind of like make it easier on your throat which can also attract kids because they're like, oh, it doesn't hurt me physically, so it's not hurting me. Um, and manufacturers of e-cigarettes, like Juul, will target youth. There was actually, um, I think it was back in 2016 or 2017, Juul got in major trouble because they were very blatantly marketing to teenagers, um, and their, their advertisements were colorful, and they, like, featured all of these young people, and um, they were just really, really trying to get to teenagers. And in my school, jewels are extremely popular. Just yesterday, I was asked by a student, do you know someone who has a jewel? Where can I get a jewel? Because kids will just pass them around because they're so easy. You can just like slip them off under the table or like, some kids will just like toss them to each other. Because mm -hmm. if it's flying through the air, you won't know what it is. It looks like a flash drive. Like teachers are like, oh, that kid just threw a flash drive for some reason, that's okay. Um, and they just do it, like right there. Uh, yeah. Um, so I told about the selling in my school. There's just with the selling, the people who usually, are, the kids who are selling them to other kids are not actually the ones who do it either. They sell the people who are addicted to it, but they don't do it themselves. That's what I've seen in my school about the selling. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much for listening to us and allowing us to share the work that we do within our school and bringing it to this higher level. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing and for adding your voice to what is a very important public health issue. So thank you very much for coming to the State House. I hope you found it interesting. It was very interesting. Yeah. Sorry we kicked out of room 11. <laughs> I just want to really um, underline what Chair Pugh said. I mean, your speaking out about this is going to have way more influence than any of ours ever will. So the fact that you're really taking this on and being leaders among your peers, it's really, really courageous. And, and amazing, so thank you. Keep up the good work. Yeah. <coughs> you want to say anything, add anything? Uh, um, the only thing I would add is um, I've, been, I've had the pleasure to work with, we have several prevention groups in our school. We have an above the influence group, a VCAT group, uh, OVX group, a pride group, and it makes a real difference when you have kids on the ground in their communities working um, to influence their peers. And um, uh, you know, thinking of prevention first, you know, I, it's like, you know, it's so much easier to deal with it at this level. And it's really important for youth voices um, within the school building to be encouraged, and whatever can be done to um, keep those groups going. The culture of a school um, can really change one way or the other, depending on if that influence is alive and well at any school. So I'd love to see it at all the schools. It's not. It's not quite happening there everywhere the way it is at Twin Valley that we're really proud of. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we, at some level, this is probably part, partly discussion and partly to see um, what, where we're going forward in terms of Jamie, these are the same are these the same amendments same the same amendments that we went through um, before but we just walked through them.
we didn't, um, which is why we put them both up here now, um, as to whether what we want to do, kind of thing. Um, so my. Probably to reorient ourselves <clears throat> a bit. Dan, can you pull up as introduced? Sure. And we can do perhaps a little bit of back and forth. Um, but really begin to look. Let's, let's look at each section <coughs> and see where we are. <clears throat> Jennifer Darby, Legislative Council. Um, so this is H663, an act relating to expanding access to contraceptives. Um, the first section of the bill as introduced would require health insurance plans to provide coverage without any deductible co-insurance, co-payment, or other cost-sharing requirement, not just for one drug device or other product within each method of contraceptive contraception for women identified by the US FDA and prescribed by the healthcare provider, but for all drugs and devices and other products within each method of contraception for women. Can we do an amendment? No. 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 This is just going back to the bill as introduced, and then we can and just wanted to show piece, this, this, and then we'll flip it, right? Amended. And then if you want, we can flip to the yeah. amended version. Um, so, and going along with this in the bill as introduced, um, there is, I took out the language that said if there's a therapeutic equivalent, um, the plan can cover you know, how, how it works for uh, if there was only one, at least one in each category. So I took out some of that language. And then put in language saying a health insurance plan would not be, uh, should not provide information under this subsection if that coverage would disqualify a high deductible health plan from eligibility for a health savings account. So if you remember, there are limitations under federal law for what you can cover first dollar um, for a high deductible plan before it loses eligibility for a health savings account. Yeah, that first section was possible. Right. So then, so then we, we uh, looked at some language, some possible amendments to section one, uh, the first of which would be to specify in the definition of health insurance plan that this is a plan offered, issued, or renewed by a health insurer or by a pharmacy benefit manager on behalf of a health insurer based on some um, information some members of the committee had received from, um, I think from Vermonters about, uh, and from the insurance companies about why the existing law may not be being followed. So can we just look at that first one? Uh, as we create a second draft of the bill and um, I'm going to have Sandy in my head when I say um, it'll probably be easiest if we end up having a strike all have a strike all rather than have our bill as introduced and then have a separate committee amendment okay um, so in does that make sense to folks? Why, why do we? It, it makes some sense to me. I'm just trying to figure out <coughs> why we have to do it separately as a committee member. I think the distinction would be instances of amendment or a strike all. Yeah. And the chair's talking about doing a strike all, but it would be from the, still from the committee. It would still be from the committee. It's still one. It would be the same thing. Yeah. And we don't have to talk about why we had one idea and then change our minds for another idea. We just talk about where we landed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We won't be discussing the underlying bill itself. So we'll be discussing a strike all amendment, right? Okay. Oh, the, when, 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 when we get there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm already or not, to tell you the truth right now. Okay. So okay. let's just go so we'll see how it comes out. And, but so whether we do a strike all 
whether we do instances of amendment, um, which we would do in terms of what we would put, if we were to do a strike all, we would be making decisions probably individual by individual, whether we want a piece in and then we would vote for the whole thing. Um, but straw poll kind of thing to add this, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Anyone not have trouble? Anyone have trouble with that? And and the reason for it for doing it is the reason for putting this language in is to the extent that an issue with the current law not being followed has to do with pharmacy benefit managers not uh, not complying. This language would make it explicit that it also applies to them. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure we all understand. Why? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. All right. So, yes. Okay. Great. The next piece is uh, the requirement for health insurance plans to provide coverage without any cost sharing and going back to at least one drug device or other product within each method of contraception for women identified by the FDA and prescribed by the health insurance provider. So instead of saying all with no cost sharing, going back to at least one, with the caveat that if there is one that is, um, that if there is a therapeutic equivalent, the plans may provide coverage and may for more than one and provide and, and impose cost sharing requirements as long as something is available in each method without cost sharing. But if somebody's healthcare provider recommends a particular service or drug device or product based on a determination of medical necessity, then the plan has to defer to the provider's determination and judgment and provide coverage without cost sharing for that product. So, yeah, we we'll go up to the yellow line. The bill as introduced was trying to get, get um, to remove a potential barrier by saying all drugs and devices. And what this says, along with the rest, is that we go with the generic or the one, unless very specifically, and, and there would be no cost sharing. Unless very specific, and there would be cost sharing if I just, if it wasn't the the um, particular drug or device that was prescribed, unless along with that prescription was it's a medical necessity. Right, I think I got a little bit lost in there, but yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, so regardless of what was prescribed, if there is a therapeutic equivalent that is available without cost sharing under our generic substitution law, that would automatically be substituted unless the provider had said, based on medical necessity, this person needs this specific product. And if that happens, there still would be no cost sharing. There, then there would be no cost sharing for that one that was appropriate, medically necessary for that patient. Okay, so we got... Regardless of that's the... It, it, Regardless of whether that's the way the um, plan's formulary typically works. So if that wasn't the, the drug that they picked to be the $0 cost share, but the doctor said it's medically necessary for this patient, and for that patient, that drug has also a $0 cost share. Okay. Topper, and then Teresa. Sorry, we're having some we have discussion as we That's go. That's fine. That's what you're um, here for. I want to put myself in the shoes of an individual. So I go in and I buy, I, I want to buy a uh, morning after pill. Over the counter, so we're outside of. Okay, let's get, no, let's get something <laughs> that isn't that then. I want to buy uh, an anti-uterine device. Okay, you're not getting into the farm, I mean, it's the doctor's putting it in, but. I'm trying to be difficult. <laughs> I think I know where you're going. You want a particular brand name. You read about a particular brand name birth control pill that's supposed to have few side effects. You want that one. Well, that's the one I, yeah. That's the one you want. Yeah. It's you made not. put shoes on for this. So, so what happens to me is 
I, I get told um, your plan covers this one particular pill that does the same thing as the one you're talking about. So I end up with that one. And I end up with the one that is the generic that's, plan. That's the, well, that's, there's probably a lot of generics, and there's... And so if there's five different kinds, the, the, the plan is going to dictate which one I get. Is yes. That, that, yes. That's and what this means? Yes. Unless the doctor says it's medically necessary for you to have another one. So if you have a personal okay. preference mm -hmm. for something else, then um, and, it, and it's within the same okay. therapeutic class okay. and, and that works, then you can pay the extra if you want, but you don't get it without posture. Yeah. And is that our generic substitution? That's under our generic substitution law, which I can pull up if that would be helpful. Okay. But it's conceivable that if you're having like major side effects, your doctor then it could be medically necessary. Then it right. could be medically necessary to have another kind. Right. Okay. I, I, I want to ask, and this may sound personal, but I don't mean it to be that way. You all know what I'm trying to do here, and what we're trying to do collectively. Mm -hmm. Is this okay with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Teresa has a question. So Correct. Not so sure. before I answer that, I want to ask this. So this just essentially is the same as what we have now. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you were trying yeah. to save, if you were trying to change something, that's not what this does. Okay. Right. This, I guess this is my this question. This piece, right. So this piece is the same as current law um, because of my understanding of what you heard in testimony from the insurance companies and, and others is that this part of the law is not the problem. It's not that people are getting prescribed something other than what they wanted and it's not the one that's available without cost sharing. The problem is that it's supposed to, they're, whatever they're prescribed, they're supposed to get without cost sharing, but they're getting charged something right. anyway. And so that's why the language in here is specific about um, the PBM also being bound by this, and then there's language that I was going to add, but actually is already in here and is probably an enforcement issue on things like um, device insertion and removal, where people are getting charged not mm -hmm. for the IUD or LARC itself, but for the insertion of it when our law says you should not. So some of it may be an enforcement issue, um, and if that's the case, then opening it up to more drugs is still not going to solve that problem. Potentially. I mean, unless it's a misunderstanding, in which case maybe somebody would have an easier time as an insurance plan understanding um, the all drugs language. But considering that the at least one in each class is under is the same under federal law under the ACA as it is under Vermont law, it shouldn't be that. You're, you're still. Um, no, I, I'm just. Mm -hmm. it seems like it's um, enforcement and education maybe of the, the people who are in insert you know when there's a physician or a, maybe instead of provider charge that that is include that should be included in this language and that's not always happening yeah I think it's it's hard to know what where the hang-up is yeah. um, and is it a coding issue is it a um, compliance issue on the insurance side <clears throat> So it's hard to know what part of the law, if any, needs to change without knowing right. why it's not working. Right. Well, I mean, maybe one thing would be to advise the yeah. patient that when you go get this prescription filled, it should cost, it should not cost you anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Except that the provider in writing it. So if you look at something like birth control, where there are a ton of them out there, may not know right. which one or one right. the person's plan covers with the no cost sharing. Right. So they may write one for a name brand knowing you're probably not getting the name brand, but they can't tell you what you're actually going to get. Depends on your your plan's formula. Right, but so now I just got totally confused. So but when the person arrives at the pharmacy and they substitute a generic, um, it still should cost that individual nothing. Yes. So the, so the physician, I guess, is, uh, the advice the, the, you're getting at the doctor's office should still be that. That's true. Okay, so when you go to get this, cost you, right, under your plan, this shouldn't cost you this anything. This should not cost you anything. So at least yeah. it, it informs the individual when they go there that maybe if, if for some reason, you know, they're now getting a salary paid $42.22, 
that um, they should ask about. I thought this wasn't supposed right. to cost me anything. Or it may also be a, a matter of education for the pharmacist, for the pharmacist that it should well. come up with no cost share. Yeah. And if it doesn't, what's, what's, what's the... the Okay, yeah. how do we how do we get to that point? That's what you're trying to solve. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I'm trying to get at. So that sounds more like education, and I, I it may be helpful to hear from um, pharmacists if they have a sense for where the disconnect is. I mean, I think what my, what I'm hearing is that there is a disconnect between what we expect will happen because of what the law says and what is actually happening. Um, and I, I haven't, I, I don't know if you have heard, I haven't heard specifically from people about, well, this is what was prescribed and my insurance plan said it should be nothing, but it's something, I mean, it, so some I've, of it is, is anecdotal. I've heard of those things. Mm -hmm. but what I'm wondering is, though, what if the, like, I'm wondering if the hang-up could also be the doctor prescribes the brand that she likes and the person goes to the pharmacy and there's a charge because it's not, you know, they have no idea what's on, what's covered on the health plan. And the pharmacist just like fills that because that's what the doctor asked for. So because I'm wondering- there are generic substitution laws. So it no, is it'll generic, immediately, okay. it goes to okay. the right. So would it be helpful okay. to pull up the generic sure. substitution law? Okay. Um, well, you're pulling that. Can I just ask another? a little confused about the other kind. So you go to your nurse practitioner to get an IUD. Can the nurse practitioner charge for the, um, the the work of inserting the IUD and then the IUD is free or is that? So under our, so let's let's do these two things separately because um, that requires going, that's okay, that requires going back to the bill. So let me, let's just look at, oops, went too far. So under our existing law, when a pharmacist receives a prescription for a drug that is listed either by generic or brand name in the most recent edition of or supplement to the Orange Book, this is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services publication, Approved Drug Products with Therapeutic Equivalence Evaluations. Um, so, so when it pharmacist receives a prescription for a drug that is listed either by generic or brand name in the most recent edition of the orange book of approved drug products, the pharmacist shall select the lowest price drug from the list, that is, which is equivalent as defined by the orange book, unless otherwise instructed by the prescriber or by the purchaser if the purchaser agrees to pay any additional cost in excess of what their plan would pay, um, or otherwise to pay, if their plan allows it, otherwise to pay full cost. Um, and then there are some various provisions under this, but that's basically, because uh, there's a lot for biologics that we added in. And uh, Jen, am yes. I correct in what we talked about last time, which is the generic substitution and, in fact, much of this part of the laws that we're looking at do not, because of ERISA, um, cover self-insured. Mm -hmm. That's right, self-insured. Mm -hmm. Uh, non-governmental plans are beyond the scope of this committee um, and, and the legislature generally, although um, many of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act do apply to those plans. Uh, I would have to look, but I would expect that this, uh, at least one product in each category without cost sharing would apply to those plans, but they would not be subject to our generic substitution law. They may or may not actually, because it's really about the pharmacist and the, and the um, prescription. So they're so because this regulates pharmacists, it may end up uh, applying to those plans as well. So some interplay of these two, I think, should should largely apply to self-insured plans, although it's very hard to tell. How? How can we figure that out? Because I mean, in, as we try to tease out where where is the issue on this? Yep. Um, so the you first have, thing is, you, let you, me you, 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 people like me who didn't know until probably ten years ago that my Blue Cross Blue Shield um, insurance from um, UVM did not have to follow all of 
the laws that we had just yeah and i would have to look at them so we um governmental plans and i think uvm as an instrumentality of the government would qualify as a governmental plan are outside the scope of ERISA, which means the state can regulate. Um, so I have to I have to find out for sure. But I think if the state employees plan, the teachers plans, um, and I would expect that plan uh, you know, would be cost within our sharing is different than my or is cost sharing different than my. Five hundred dollar deductible. Deductible is a form of cost sharing. Um, so, and that's where we get into the piece with the high deductible plans, because um, making something subject to the deductible requirement is a form of cost sharing. Um, that you have to pay the amount you have to pay out of pocket before the insurance mm -hmm. really kicks in, and and that's the piece that the federal government decides what you can and can't exempt from the deductible um, for purposes of a high deductible plan and its compatibility with a health savings account. So under this, Jen, yes. does a person with one of those plans that you just described, the, the way the thing was written in the beginning, it doesn't matter. They don't pay, is that correct? I'm not sure where you're looking. You just talked about a, a high deductible plan. Okay. So, if, so the way, I, the way I was, what I was trying to do, it, it didn't matter what kind of plan they had, or whether they had a plan or not, they got it for nothing. Uh, under the existing statute, <laughs> where it's at least one drug device or product in each method, yes, because that happens at the federal. That's a requirement under the Affordable Care Act. Um, that applies to all insurance plans, and I'm going to verify whether it applies to self-insurance. Um, if you expand it to all drugs, devices, and products in each category, as we had in the, in the beginning. bill as introduced, then no, it would not apply for a somebody with a high deductible plan. They would not get all of them without cost sharing because the federal government decides what you can take out of the deductible and they have not put all forms of contraception uh, in all, across all categories in that list. So in your opinion, the best way to go to get the best bang for what we want to do here is, is to go with um, at least one drug. So for people with a high deductible plan, it doesn't change anything either way. Oh, okay. um, right. But I think it sounded like from the insurance company's standpoint, there was potential additional cost to the system if you open it up to all drugs. Um, because you can have people getting more expensive brand name drugs for which uh, that are not preferred on the insurance company's formulary, and when that happens, the insurance company has to pay the whole thing, which means it gets spread out through everyone's premiums. It may not be a lot once you spread it out, but um, so there could be nominal additional cost by doing the version as introduced. Additional cost to the insurance company. And, yes, and therefore to premium to rate payers. So in a set I mean, to see if Shayla is paying attention. <laughs> um, the only way, the only way that we could um, assure that all of this, um, the contraception would be available free of cost to all people who use contraception. You mean would, each, every method, every right. brand? Would be if the state of Vermont decided to um, fund them and buy them, and the health department or some other, we hand them out. Hand them down on the street corner. Yeah, yes. I mean, and so maybe, and so therefore, we would all be paying because our taxes would go up. 
I mean, well, the, oh, yes, the, the only way I am aware no, no, I'm saying, I mean, the only way we can get around some of the insurance uh, issues and the federal issues is if we took insurance out of it entirely. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying that really well, is. The insurance company would be the ones that would not no, make no, no, as much money. No, we can't tell certain we can't tell certain, we can't tell certain businesses, certain types of businesses what to do with their insurance. Right. We're not allowed to. Fed say yep. we can't do that. Preempted under ERISA. And so the only way we could get around that would be to appropriate more money to the health department or DEBA or something and say, oh yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm so paying attention. Um, <laughs> No, I do just want to share with you from the health department. I do just want to remind the committee about, and this is not for all women, but the previously what was the Title X funding that the state has now replaced because we're not using the federal Title Ten dollars, but that does provide, in a, in a sense, that kind of safety net service for women who cannot afford um, contraception. We, we do, in essence, we do do that for those particular. So the problem so, solved. Yeah. Just right. I didn't yeah. say problem solved. <laughs> it's for, uh, for those Subsection. women. Yeah. Subset. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would just also add into that that for most self-insured plans, they are administered by someone else. But all, a lot of them, I can't say all of them, but a lot of them have don't have the cost sharing for preventative type things. So if you if you go online, you look up, you know, I have to have my colonoscopy or something. It costs a certain amount if it's if it's medically necessary because you're sick. But if it's because you turned 50, it's it, they don't charge you anything. So I would assume preventive for contraception would be the same way. You wouldn't have to pay any of the cost share, like the deductible, in order to get it because it's preventive for pregnancy, right? I mean. I don't, I don't, I mean, I would imagine that it's covered. I, I have no sense for whether it would be available without cost sharing. Um, tell me, Topper, what I am gathering from both the conversations, reports that, that folks had with insurers as well as the information that Legislative Council is giving us around what is our current statutory and what are our parameters around um, what we can what we can impact as a state legislature and what we cannot based on federal law that if your goal was to have everybody be able to get it at no cost that's not really necessarily something that we can promise we can get further by um, adding the pharmacy benefit mm -hmm. people, um, and that maybe to have some more testimony um, from pharmacists um, and, and others in terms of um, why this isn't happening. Um, um, could we put a, a, a line in, Jen, that says <coughs> that if um, if the law is not followed, there's a consequence to it, and state a consequence. Maybe that would make people not charge people when they shouldn't be. Uh, well, I mean, I think in DFR's existing enforcement authority, there is that they have fairly broad enforcement authority. I, so. I think the issue is maybe, or the, the threshold question is, does DFR know of any problems? Is DFR doing any enforcement now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, okay, well, I, mean, okay. I think we need to find that out. Okay. Because if it's not happening, from what I understand, it is not happening. People are being charged stuff. Mm -hmm. um, then we should get that corrected. The other thing that um, <clears throat> that I'm hearing more and more about now, as as word is getting out about this, um, that um, the procedure itself, people are getting charged for that. Right. So I want to go I'm back to that because that this, was. I'm not just hearing this from what we heard last week. 
<coughs> of hearing it from individuals. So I think that's what Representative Brumstead was starting to ask earlier, so I did want to come back to that. So that's the language that it's existing law, so I highlighted it and put it in bold, but it's not underlined because it's existing law. Hmm. Says a health insurance plan shall provide coverage without any deductible coinsurance copayment co payment or other cost sharing requirement for clinical services associated with providing the drugs, devices, products, and procedures covered under this section and related follow up services, including management of side effects, counseling for continued adherence, and <laughs> device insertion and removal. Yeah. And, so and it's, so it's, that's that's, okay. that's existing law. And, and, and it's so that's, not working. So that's why we need to have DFR yeah. come to yeah. you. Right. And you need maybe that. we can look to the inch. I mean, there's a part of me that's going also to look to the insurers um, who, I mean, I mean, in the sense of um, if it's their financial, if it's a coding issue or something like that, if whoever is in charge of um, sending the bills out or whatever, or I guess it's right at the pharmacy because that's it comes up at the pharmacy. Well, it depends if you're if we're talking device oh, insertion yeah. and removal, or if we're talking. I mean, I don't. I, mean, I guess I don't know if there's anything about education. You should hear from the insurers, the pharmacists, that um, I.e. a piece of paper in English, not in. <laughs> I, and I'm saying that generically in English, not in language that nobody understands in terms of its use of fancy words. That you, most people should be able to get this for free, <laughs> you know, uh, or whatever, uh, you know, if you, you know, if you, or, or if you have, yeah. Why don't we just ask that question? Yeah. Well, oh, right. There's a, isn't there an insurance person in there? Well, um, but there's, yes, there are. Um, but I, I, I'm assuming that she will answer something when she's able to answer it. And um, she may want to come back, or do you want to answer now? Susan Gretkowski, MVP Healthcare. Um, I probably could answer it now, but I think given the level of what appears to be confusion, and to be honest, I've gotten a little confused during this conversation. So I think I would like to take this back and then come back. So can you tell me what you are confused about? Because I'm now perfectly clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> OK. So um, the way I understand it, the current law says for each class or type of birth control, we have to offer one with no cost sharing. We still co we cover all of them, or we can choose to cover all of them, but the rest would be with cost sharing. So what the bill is filed would do is to say um, no cost sharing for anything. So you know every single one and every single class has no cost sharing. But we're sure, and we're they're moving away from that. Back to the away. yeah. So I think that's where I'm confused so during the discussion is where you are in that moving away from and you know exactly what the confusion is. So I believe we are moving yeah, away one. from it. Because as I understand it, our generic substitution law does the same thing, already does what we were trying to do. Effectively. I mean I think I think the expansion may not get you much a much different result than the existing law because of the generic substitution law. And, and if, if I may, I think, you know, the rest of the provisions in the current law that Jen has gone through about, you know, if a provider says that for whatever your medical condition, you couldn't tolerate the one that was at the no-cost share, you know, so I'm going to prescribe you this other one, you know, the, the law, existing law, makes that clear. So it seems like it's all covered uh, on all those levels. So. Okay, and now let's ask the question that I asked. The person is getting a device. Mm -hmm. Someone else has to insert this device. Mm -hmm. It says here they're not supposed to be charged. Mm -hmm. My question is, are they being charged? Is that what you need to go back and find out? Well, I mean, 
again, Susan Mirkowski, I'm not aware of any complaints. I, you know, I think, again, that would be DFR perhaps. You know, is DFR getting complaints? I mean, every now and then we do hear from DFR about maybe implementation of a colonoscopy mandate or something like that, and we all go back and check and, you know, do analysis. We have not been contacted by them about this. Okay, let me ask the question a different way. To your knowledge, is anybody getting charged? To my knowledge, no, but that it would not be like it. Sandy. I think I also am going to ask the health care ombudsman mm -hmm. to come in mm -hmm. Good idea. Um, yeah, to see if there have been any, um, shall I say, many of us are around the table either because of personal experience, family members, or friends or constituents coming to us and indicating issues um, have seen this as a problem. Um, yes, but they didn't even know it was a problem because they thought that they were supposed to get charged for that. Right. Um, okay. Uh, so we've talked a lot in this room uh, in other contexts about the Medical Practice Board. And I'm wondering whether, and I think this may be a question for the Health Department, uh, whether mm -hmm. it's possible for, for the Medical Practice Board to remind doctors about stuff like this. You're not supposed to charge for the insertion of IED. So they, so uh, to be clear, they charge, but they charge insurance, right. and insurance yeah, should not be allowing there to be cost sharing okay. right. for the patient. Okay. This, this is why I'm not that's sure why the, the payers are who should, we should be concentrating on. Yeah. Frankly, I think in terms of this piece, yeah. they, they all have edits and they all have things that you know these these claims have to pass through, and there should be an edit there that says if I've got a claim coming through for this and it's pulling is putting out a cost share that should go to an exception pile and get reviewed. That's this is it should be dealing with the insurance company, not the doctors and the, right. I, I, right. I mean, the doctors. to the extent that you were interested in, in having the insure or having the providers, the doctors or the pharmacists being on the lookout or telling their patients, you know, you should expect not to get charged for this, you could do that. But I think you're right that um, that it's really, if, it, if the law is not being followed, it sounds like it's at the payer level, and then it may be a matter of either um, education for the payers or education for us if it's a payer that's outside of our ability to uh, regulate. And, and I'll just say that you or someone in your office be able to do some research in terms of where the intersection of federal law, either around ERISA or around the ACO, is around these particular... Yes, yeah, so the note, I've, note, I've made myself two notes. Okay. One is contraceptive coverage under the ACA for the self-insured, and Susan is also under the impression that it's the same uh, for self-insured plans, ERISA plans under the federal law under the ACA as it is for commercial insurance plans, and you have just mimicked the commercial insurance coverage for the most part, in your, certainly you have in this piece of your law. My other question, but I will also look at it specifically, and then my other question to look at is, um, just to, to confirm for myself, is um, under our generic substitution law, is it agnostic as to whether somebody is self-insured or insured by commercial insurance or otherwise because it's regulating the activities of the pharmacist in doing the substitution. I expect so, but I just want to get confirmation. Thank you. And what about the person who doesn't have insurance? This is a requirement for insurance coverage. If it's somebody who doesn't have insurance and is on Medicaid, that's their insurance. Um, I, and then whatever the, the um, eligibility requirements are for the health department's program. But if you have a, a high earner who chooses not to pick up insurance and is paying out of pocket, then they will pay out of pocket for this as well. Okay. I believe there's individuals in the state of law that are on Medicaid. That are not on a Medicaid? Yes, we have a 3% uninsured rate. So those people, if they walk in, if they have no, so if they are income eligible and have signed up for the health department program, which I think is broader than Medicaid, 
um, they would be covered with no money out of their pocket under the health department program. If they are, if they are make too much money to qualify for the health department program, they are, and they have not picked up insurance or coverage anywhere else. They have elected to pay for health costs out of their own pocket, and they would pay for these health costs out of their own pocket as well. If they don't have any kind of coverage and they haven't signed up for a program, I, I don't, I mean, other than you could appropriate money directly to have products available perhaps at the provider's office, but I don't, otherwise, I don't know okay. how you get them something for free. People who haven't signed up for Medicaid are generally going to end up in Planned Parenthood. So again, the program that was previously Title 10, so if you're income eligible, if you walk into a Planned Parenthood and you are uninsured, you can get um, contraception for free. The devices and everything. Yes, all nine yards. Um, Lucy? Uh, Lucy from Planned Parenthood, yeah, that's, 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 that's correct. And if for some reason someone is um, kind of completely outside of the system, we also have a sliding fee scale um, for those very rare cases. Which means it's essentially free if they come in with a incumbents. For the time being, can we move on? Okay. So that's section one, unless there's more that you wanted to look at in either version of section one. Okay. Section, section two requires school districts to coordinate with the Department of Health to distribute and make available to all students in its secondary schools free of charge over-the-counter contraceptive devices and products. Do we have an amendment to, to that in your strike ball, in your amendment? No. There was discussion last week about the Health Department and Agency of Education coming up with some proposed language on the two options, or two, two uh, directions they suggested. Are you ready for that? Jayla, are you um, Jayla, let me put it on the <laughs> So I just was able to catch up with Rep. Redmond this morning, um, and we should have something from AOE and BDH like tomorrow. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, so um, I think Yeah. Will that address both sections two and three? Section two is, is what schools are supposed to do, and section three is what the department is supposed to do. Um, so, uh, yes, the, it will address both of those. Does it talk about an education program for the public? Uh, it does not, if you'd like it to. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I think. I think that um, Shayla should bring it to us tomorrow. We can look at it and then we can, I think it's hard to, like, I think you have to look at it and see it. Um, and then we can fiddle with it and add to it whatever you want to do. Unless you have a specific. No, I just had a note. Make sure that there's a public, uh, some kind of a, um, education campaign for people who aren't in school. Because we do a lot, we've got a big education program in the school, yeah. all schools. Yeah. And what about somebody who's not going to school? So I think one of the I think one of the concerns we spoke about and I think um, we should meet I think that we should sit down with as well and review it. But one of the concerns that came up are just the limitations of the health department to be able to, you know, staff-wise, resource-wise, to be able to take on some kind of endeavor like that. So that's... I think we could add that to our budget now. I mean, I mean seriously, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. like that is something... Right, 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 right. Um, so, so looking, looking anyway, at... Anyway, 
looking at our schedule, yeah, yes. to, um, uh, um, tomorrow we have a lot of lots, lots to talk about in terms of wood side. Then there's a naturalization happening. But at the same time, then we're going, oh, yeah, there's that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and then there's um, um, some, um, some more testimony around the older uh, Vermonters Act. Um, we, and, um, it, okay, it looks like we, can, we can't come back to this until with any degree of assuredness until Friday or late in the, or, le, or, or later Thursday afternoon. <coughs> Looking at what's on the, mm -hmm. on the schedule. Um, I feel it does. Because I mean, I think our Thursday morning will be full with the, um, and then I don't, without knowing what's gonna be on the floor on Thursday, but I would, uh, well, we should uh, let's counsel. Yes. Um, you only have seven committees to go to. What are you? Um, what are you? Perhaps a little. Are you a little bit free? Um, like at three thirty on Thursday, or three? Yes. Yeah, so, yes. I think either one. I have a bill, but it's not really mine. So um, okay. three thirty would be great. Okay. So three thirty. We'll we'll get back to the the okay. at three thirty. Um, Committee. In terms of this bill, we took up. We still have one more. We had a, a, a discussion about the bill. We still have one more. And pharmacists. We still have one more section too. I don't know. If you oh, right. One more section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Potentially. Oh. It's just the, the, the potential oh, okay. section on the manager. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. So this was the the other piece that I brought to you in uh, the possible amendments, which is a possible new section on the mandatory reporter law, um, making clear that a mandatory, and maybe I should call who they're actually mandated reporter, a mandated reporter as described in subdivision A2 shall not be deemed to have violated the requirements of this section, which is to report suspected child abuse and neglect solely on the basis of distributing or making available over-the-counter contraceptive devices and products to secondary school students in accordance with sections two and three of the bill. So if there are changes to sections two and three of the bill, we may need to make some changes to this language. Go ahead, yes. Is that right? um, I'm just again a little. I'm curious about the age to be the consent. If it's 15 or 16, how can, let's say, a 13 year old give consent if it's against the law? If, if they don't have the legal ability to do it. Um. So uh, so. I don't know that they could, they certainly couldn't enter into a contract. I think there are uh, levels of potential levels of capacity to consent in different contexts, but this is really about reporting child abuse and neglect, not whether people are engaging in sexual activity, but making available protection in the event that they do engage in sexual activity. But can they engage in sexual activity? Well, they do without. I know they do. I know they do. But the law is that they are not at the age. I think it's under 15. So they they're not at the age where they can give consent to do that. So it's not. You know, I know they do, and I want to protect them and everything. I'm just wondering about the legal piece of it. So I don't know that I have much more to say on it. Maybe somebody from our judiciary team has more to say, I mean, that what the law talks about is, whoops, is what, what is considered, <coughs> you have stuff? Yes. Oh, great. I'd have to find you, this jailer is in the California, I'd have to find you the exact um, citation, mm -hmm. but there are certain areas of substance abuse and um, certain sexual activity where a, a minor can consent to treatment. Um, yes, they can, right, they can I, consent I to mental health that. treatment, they can consent to, yeah, consent to treatment for substance use and for sexually transmitted diseases, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so there, so while there is nothing in the law that, that so there are re prohibitions on engaging in a sexual act with another person uh, uh, and compelling the person to engage in the sexual act without the consent of the other person. Um, 
So it, it's possible that the activity itself would be, uh, that the sexual activity itself would be criminal. Um, but this bill is looking at providing contraceptives. So it is not taking a position on the legality or illegality. It's going with, I think, what Shayla may have referred to as the harm reduction model that's used in other areas, which is to protect the people involved. So you're saying that a guidance counselor or teacher, if a student came to them and said, or a nurse, you know, I'd like contraception, then as a mandated reporter, if they're under the age of consent, they don't need to report that. That's right. Okay. They, right. So they are not, they, so, or to put it on the flip side, the, the person, the guidance counselor, whoever, has not violated the mandatory reporting requirement by not reporting that a student asked for contraceptive, over-the-counter contraceptive products. Thank you. But the age is not specified, right? The age is not specified. I mean, the, the age is specified in the underlying bill in the sense that it's talking about secondary um, school students. So it's talking about secondary school students, which is grades 7 through 12. So if that, if, if the language in section 2 in particular stays in, it would be specific to secondary schools. So that would be maybe my second grade enough. What we all can take a look at is the material that was sent out by the Agency of Education last Friday. Um, was it last Friday? Two Fridays ago. Um, that talked about the underlying um, requirements around health education that includes sex education and things and the, what they are. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Um, the other, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just say, what, is there an educational piece in this bill? That's what I was, you know, I mean, you talk about what the education department is doing, but does this bill reference this? Not yet. Not I yet. think that's some of what you have asked mm -hmm. the health department and the agency of education no, to coming. bring out. Yes. Yeah. Couple days, no. Couple days, couple days. Coming. But we first asked, we asked them to talk to each other. Mm. And we did that with a letter <laughs> last year. And we blow balls. And we succeeded. <laughs> we, we, we succeeded. Was <laughs> easy. Um, so, you know, we did that. Um, we did um, hear a bill presentation um, around pharmacies, pharmacies, um, pharmacists. Um, dispensing, um, and um, we also had it had. It was brought was brought up that the across the hall in government operations they are doing a broad broad. They're they're taking a really in depth look at the uh, many things, including the pharmacy board and what is the responsibility of pharmacists and expanding, um, and that's one of the recommendations general expansion or, or changing of what pharmacists can do. It's one of the recommendations right. of some group that met over this summer. Right. Yes, I think it came from OPR. OPR. And the OPR bill, which is starting in, the, in Senate GovOps, would include some language and on so, around pharmacists um, prescribing. And the, so that that's where potentially this piece would go, uh, rather than um, now, there's the other thought is that we could add that, and then we take some testimony from this and let it sugar out as it comes from one place or another. Well, we were taking testimony on the bill by itself, right. separate from right. this bill, but we were thinking of possibly putting in this bill. Mm -hmm. What you're saying now, they're taking Well, I mean, it my, my question, my, I mean, that really is a question. Is it belts and suspenders mm -hmm. to put it in this bill while hoping that it will be put in the Senate or put in the House. Um, and then by the time these bills that are starting in different bodies come and cross, 
I love belts and suspenders. <laughs> so do I. I, I. So do I. So do I. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I think that uh, I want to confuse things in this bill. I want to keep this nice and clean. Mm -hmm. That's so, my position. Uh, so I, I, I agree I, with I the other the, stuff, but I, right. I, I um, no offense about this bill, but I think, frankly, in terms of what it is that we're wanting to achieve, that has more likelihood of doing it than anything we're doing in this bill my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. The pharmacy. Yes. Yeah. I agree. The pharmacy piece is big. It is. Well, what I mean is that I think that if we're looking to have easier access for youth in particular, but anybody, easier access for youth, um, I think that that does it more efficiently. That's just my opinion. And my, my sense is that it's easier to go to your pharmacist and ask for some of these things, I think, than it is to go through a whole doctor's appointment and all of the things. some of it you can't get for right, the pharmacist. Right, right. That is the case, That's too. True. But I think at least you have the options by either going to your pharmacist and getting this list of services or your doctor and getting this list of services. But you have some choices. What can't you get from a pharmacy? Like an IED or a, an IED. something is served. Well, you can't get it, but under the billion. Under the proposed billion. Well, not the ones I think we're reversible kind of receptive because that is. Inserted okay. into I, the like, 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 provider like, has to. Yeah, I don't think yeah. much pharmacy. No, we don't want pharmacy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to think about that. I said you don't want pharmacy. Yeah. Um, in terms of belts, it's, and this is this is you know this is discussion. I mean, but this is rough draft. How's that? Um, how many people um, in the language of rough draft, which means it can come out of state at another time? But let's um, would like to to proceed with the belts and suspenders which would be to add that um, bill um, to this bill, which would be we take some different, more testimony. Of course, I mean, we're going to take more testimony anyway. So how many people want belts and suspenders? Raise your hand. I'm confused what you mean by that. By belts and suspenders, the, 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 the section that would, the bill that would say. 752. 752. <coughs> Just right. fold it in. To fold it in, add that to We're this bill. But there's no real belts and suspenders. So you just say adding them together. Correct. Yes, correct. correct. The belts and suspenders refers to what's going on in the in government operations about about pharmacy practice in general. There's no age limitation come. on that bill 752, which I I couldn't go along with. There'd have to be some age limitation. So I think it said it's left up to the pharmacist. Well. Yes and no. I mean, I think we should really have an age limitation. It would so potentially, I, could potentially be up to the board. Unless that's changed. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so okay. we could specify right. that that was part of the board's rules or so. I'm sorry. I, I lost my count with the belts mm -hmm. and suspenders. And I, I would say this, Madam Chair. If if we're going to do that in the beginning, um, I thought it was good. Yeah. Um, if we're going to do that, then we, we really need to make a decision whether we are going to do that or not. But not, because what I'm worried about is if we, we're talking about doing it, and the, the people that are working on that uh, across the hall think we're going to do it, and then all of a sudden at the end of it we say, well, now we're not going to do this. It's going to confuse, you know, we ran into a problem and the whole building stopped by it then to me, we've done an injustice in this area, and we've done an injustice in the other area. So I, I think, because we're getting close to the time when we have, we have to start getting this thing out of here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm worried about. Okay, I hear that. So, um, so I will argue, A, um, that, that the, the big OPR bill, I think, is a big bill, and I, 
I guess I, I have questions about whether that's going to really move this year. That's number one. Number two, what I, my vote just now was to fold this into a draft and we start to really, we start to really um, go into the weeds on the language. We haven't done that yet. No. And get testimony on it. So, right. so I'm not, I am not endorsing, you know, every word in this bill. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying let's, let's fold this concept into your, into H6663 and look at it here. And we can, we can amend it as we go along. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. Gotcha. Um, but it also gives the, the world who are sitting around gotcha. following mm -hmm. what we are doing. I'm more than willing to do that. Well, uh, I'll do that. The opportunity as as, to go, ooh, mm, okay. horrible idea. Or, you know, this is absolutely perfect, the best thing, but what you need to do is do this. Okay. Um, and I can bring up my age issue. And to bring up your age issue. issue. No, everyone gets to bring up their issues except Carl. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm going to have an arm job. <laughs> I'll take the stress ball. <laughs> <laughs> I got a new one today, grapes. I got a new one today. So, yes, add 752 for the next draft. Yes. Take a look at All right. Meanwhile, I apologize, but I think I was supposed to ask uh, Senator White how they were doing on it in her bill. So, I will follow up on that today. Mm -hmm. Or all of a sudden it's coming back. Or tomorrow or the next day. Like We're going to take this up again on first. All right. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> and Shay, uh, um, Shayla's going to circle back with you on that language <laughs> so you can take a look at it. Jen, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and we, we, have, we have lots of people. Um, well, before Jen leaves, did you anything no. more to? The second question. Okay, okay. And so, Shayla, if you actually could provide us with um, some more um, information in terms of that, that would be great. Um, do you want to discuss H635 at all while I'm here? Or is that I'm sorry, what? The oh, short yes. forms? Oh, yes. What? Oh, the short form bill. Since I'm here. Oh, yeah, okay, yes, since you're here. Um, I was born on Thursday. What short form bill? Um, and, um, you know, this, is, the, the, um, this is the topper afternoon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> topper. Oh, oh, receivership. Are you talking about receivership? Yep. Yes. Oh, and, and, okay. All right. Uh, All right. Yeah, this is the topper part. Good idea. Um, so, um, oh, my God. And, 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 um, and so, um, and, and before, just other people who are here for this other bill, if you would like to be testifying or if you have a group that wants to testify, uh, you know, let us know. Do we know who that woman was who just left? No. Okay. Well, oh, agency of education. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> she was here last week. So okay. Well, you know, I don't always recognize people, and so if you, you know, I was like trying to say if you want to testify, so I just said, okay. All right. So Thursday when I was gone, yeah. Um, you took up two bills, and what, what happened with H-635? Do we think it was a good idea? That was the receivership bill we heard from yeah, the... we voted it out. You voted it out. You're reporting. <laughs> AG's office, uh, most, mostly from the AG, mm -hmm. um, and and he walked through how the three elements of that related to the um, the litigation that they had last year um, with the receivership and whatever the name of that place Pillsbury. was. Pillsbury, yeah, Pillsbury. Pillsbury. Um, Pillsbury. And 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 he, I found I found his testimony very compelling. Yes, the interviews were so cute about it. He said, I don't know if I explain the looked to someone else who was here and said, you did a great job. I think it was very, I mean, he was also very specific about how this would be helpful mm -hmm. in future situations. Mm -hmm. so, so we would like to work on this. Yeah. Everyone who wants to work on it, can we raise our hands? OK. Um, Legislative Council informed us that we, we have to For do something. <laughs> uh, we have new rules. Yeah, they're not new. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Um, so um, does this have to be a, um, a vote that By the clerk um, calls, or can we? Um, I don't know. So it says, here's all it says. The short form bill shall be drafted in standard form by the legislative council only if requested by a majority vote of the committee to which the bill has been referred. And then the request doesn't doesn't necessarily mean you intend to do anything with it. But then it says, um, oh, okay. So I. So I don't know that you have to record the vote. I just. Okay, you just wanted to follow. I just wanted to follow your lead. <laughs> okay, so everyone, please raise your hand. Raise your hand. If we're going to take this, what do you do? Can we like language? Short form is trans. Can we do a short form? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, I'm sure you want to. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think you're right. If the camera is still on, uh, <laughs> the majority um, of the committee, in fact. Um, Ten members of the committee and, and someone left their vote. I understand. I think she, she uh, yeah. so, yeah. What that means is we have um, the majority of the committee has um, requested of Jen that she um, draft a Regular long form form, yes. bill, Regular. and now we will then we will discuss it. Yes. And you, and you uh, have the language. Right? I do have the language. Yes. You so do. I yes. So from I'm, Dale. I'm all set. Yeah, yeah from Dale. Because I think, I mean, it's, I don't think it's anything different than we had originally talked about. Um, so yes, and if I have questions, actually, I think Jamie suggested a, a better way, Jamie from the AG's office suggested what he thought was a better way to address um, one of the pieces, the part about the temporary receiver. Um, so I will confer with him and Commissioner Hutt to make sure we're getting the right language. Yeah, she was um, in during the testimony. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I just want to make sure. I don't recall if she said anything. She, she, she did a little. Oh, yeah. you heard yeah. from. Uh, yeah. What did you hear from? Uh, Pam Coda. Yes. I was just sitting with it. No, you heard no. from Pam Coda. Yeah. From the department. Well, you're not going to be bored anymore. Well, I have not been. No. <laughs> 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 I'm very careful. Because we've heard from the other side already. But variety is good. Okay. Oh, we, we heard from the other side. Sure. Yeah. 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 Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, for the record, uh, Jim Dayburn, I'm Vice Consul with Katie McLean, Office of Budget Council. Here we go. Um, so, we thought maybe we would go through um, the current law first uh, to get familiar with how the current law works, and then go through the draft that the House Education Committee is considering at this stage. Um, so, the current law is uh, here in Section 829. Um, and uh, I won't do all the wording here, but I want to get, give you a sense of how this works. Um, so first of all, the definition of pre-K child uh, is a child who is um, three or four years of age, or is five years of age, but is not yet enrolled in kindergarten. That right there is a quite controversial definition. Um, so I'm going to pause there for a minute. Um, because it says it's not yet enrolled in kindergarten, um, and because there's another statute that says something different <laughs> in the green books, uh, this has caused a lot of confusion. So the five-year-olds who are eligible for kindergarten can still attend pre-K and get the, the state voucher. Um, so um, this says that if you're not enrolled in kindergarten, therefore you can get the, the voucher, um, even if you're eligible for kindergarten but you don't go uh, yet. Um, that's what, that's what this says. Another section we'll, we'll come back to later on sa says um, something like um, not, um, it's about el 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 eligibility to be enrolled uh, in kindergarten. Um, and, and so we come to the language of the giraffe we'll go through. This language will change. And basically, uh, the change will be to make uh, pre-K the voucher uh, available only for kids who are three and four years of age and five years if you're not, um, if you're um, eligible to be in kindergarten, you can't get the voucher um, for pre-K unless you're on IEP or 504 plan. So there's been some changes here, uh, a lot of confusion in the field uh, that's trying to be taken care of and the draft will come through. Um, Pre-K education uh, is, is education designed for this population of kids. Uh, we have a 
pre-K private provider? Um, so the, the pre-qualified private provider, um, that's a term that's in the existing statute, the pre-qualified, and that's something that we're going to see kind of disappear in the next draft in terms of pre-qualification. Um, did you want to no. skip down? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go uh, the access to uh, be here. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have the access to publicly funded pre-K education. Um, so currently, no fewer than 10 hours a week of publicly funded pre-K is available for 35 weeks annually to each pre-K child whom a parent or guardian wishes to enroll in an available and pre-qualified program um, that's operated by either a public school or a private provider. Uh, and then in subdivision B2, if the parent or guardian chooses to enroll the pre-K child in an available pre-qualified program, then pursuant to the choice of the parent or guardian, the school district or resident shall do the following. Um, do you want to yeah. For that yeah. So, so, so basically, the school districts are paying out of their own budgets uh, the voucher. The voucher is about thirty-four hundred dollars, uh, approximately, and um, the parent can either enroll their child in their public pre-K program in their town, if if it's offered in their town, uh, or the parent can uh, choose to uh, have their child go to a pre-K program. In another town, so a public program offered maybe if you're living in Montpelier, maybe in Burlington, or uh, you can uh, enroll your child in a private pre-K provider. So you've got options here, obviously. Um, no matter how it's done, the child child will be counted uh, um, uh, in the resident district's ADM count, which we'll come back to, which goes goes to how you get equalized pupils and the benefit you get uh, there. We'll come back to that, but. However you do it, the school district uh, either enrolls the student or pays away uh, and, and, and enrolls that child for ADM purposes, which we'll come, we'll come back to. Um, so um, four goes into uh, language that will be changed, because this talks about the, the, the supply pre-K uh, public and private providers. And if it's insufficient, this contemplates basically a conversation with Building Bright Futures and uh, trying to figure out how to increase capacity uh, for the region. Um, then we're going to see which is around pre-qualification, which I think Katie, you've got. Sure. Um, so pre-qualification, again, the term pre-qualification goes away in the next draft, but the concept of their certain quality criteria remains. So in this language, in existing law, um, it says that enrolled both AOE and AHS have to determine if public and private programs are pre-qualified, and if so, um, if they can be part, they can be part of a publicly accessible database. And the rules are to indicate how a provider applies for and maintains pre-qualification status and minimum quality um, standards. And then um, we go into a list of what are those quality standards. So for private and public programs, they have to have one of the following on this list that starts with number one. Um, so first, they can have a National Association for Education of Young Children accreditation, or they can have at least four stars from um, DCF STARS <coughs> program and with a plan to get um, points, two points from the five arenas. And I think you've had um, DCF come in and walk you through what the different arenas were in the STARS program. One of them is like families and communities, um, so different areas. Um, and then the alternative option is three STARS with a plan to come into compliance um, and get an additional STAR. Um, so that's the three STARS with a plan. And I highlight that one because that <coughs> under the um, working language in house education, that um, number C, three stars with a plan goes away. And then in subdivision two, this is that a licensed provider must employ a contract for services with one teacher who is licensed and endorsed in either uh, early childhood education or special education. And subdivision three, um, this states that a registered family child care home that is not, that does not have a licensed and endorsed um, teacher in early education or early special education shall use regular, active supervision and training from a licensed and endorsed teacher. So that's another place to pause around the words um, 
active supervision and training because um, that's another place where we're going to see a difference once we move to the existing proposal. Okay, and then sub, uh, section D deals with uh, tuition budgets and ADM. So part of this is a bit repetitious from earlier. So as I mentioned before, <coughs> the, the district of residence will pay the tuition from its own budget um, for the 10 hours per week. Uh, it's either another public program or a private program. Um, there are some notices that have to be uh, uh, given back and forth, um, which is more procedural. Um, and then two says that any, any cost of operating a pre-K education program goes into the district's budget. And then three says that um, the district of residence may include in its ADM any pre-K child for whom it has provided pre-K education or on whose behalf it has paid tuition pursuant to this section. We'll come to the ADM part, but basically the count for a pre-K child is 0.46. Um, I'll come back to that uh, shortly. The next section is a rulemaking section, which is actually pretty significant because that's part of the structure that is proposed to change. So, can, can we maybe stop here? Because I had stopped sending no questions until we finished the section. <laughs> this section seems to be long. Yeah. A it's a very long <laughs> time. <laughs> and I'm afraid that some of us won't be able to remember what our questions are. That's awesome. And we'll start with Teresa, who will remember. Okay, but only because I wrote it down. Um, uh, way back in the beginning, um, you talked about, uh, where did I find it now? Uh, okay, number one, A1. Um, district of Residence. Um, is not yet enrolled. Da, 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 da. Uh, it was the eight. Wherever you talk about age. Um, right there, uh, number one here. Okay. Yeah. The date established by the district of residence. So, has there been any discussion downstairs about? Um, so, for kindergarten, there's a defined date. Um, in pre-K, we leave it up to the districts yeah. to define it. So, is there any discussion about having a defined date for pre-K? No. Because um, it, it, okay, that answers my question. I don't like that answer, but that's the answer to my question. It's just, uh, we just, I, I hear continually from people that, oh, well, in this district it's this date, and in this district so, so, so it's that me, date. I'm sorry, let me be, see if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. First of all, do um, I have to send my kid to school in first grade? Do I have to send my kid to school in kindergarten? Kindergarten, or I, I think, I think kindergarten, I have to check on that. I'm not sure if I know the answer to that. Okay. I, think, I think this is yes, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so is the answer to Teresa's question, if I'm born, if I'm, if my birthday is September 1st, whatever year that's going to be, that makes me go to, uh, and I go to, I go to first grade. But if I'm August, three days now, September 15th. If I, my, uh, my birthday is August 31st, if September 1st is the cutoff, I wouldn't go to first grade until the following year. And all zillion public schools, however many we have, um, around the state have that same date as September 1st or whatever the date is. I believe so. The flexibility, I believe, comes in pre-K. Uh, Area only where. So it's only in pre K I, where we. I, say, mm -hmm. I believe so. I want to confirm that for kindergarten. That's my understanding as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, and so then my second question mm -hmm. was do we know how many three star pre K private programs there are? Um, I don't have that information. Okay. I could get it from CDD just to know what kind of impact that this might be having if we eliminate that as an option. I mean, you know that? It's going to be two stars. Carl. Following up on the three-star thing, I just want to make sure I understood. You're saying you're eliminating the three-star program as pre-eligible or whatever you called it, uh, even if they have a plan, right, to go to four-star. You're just eliminating that whole thing. Yes. Under the proposal that House Education is currently working on, 
yes, that subdivision would so go away. So they have to be four star. So they would have to either have the um, sort of the accreditation from NACI, or they would have to have the four stars. What What's the certification? The about? National uh, National okay, Association NACI. for uh, okay. Education yeah. of Young Children. Right, or four star. Four okay. four so, stars. And what you're saying is how many? How many yeah, how, no, how many is that? How many right. students that is? Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's for especially a starting up operation, uh, it makes it a lot longer to get to four stars to right. be able to do a pre-K program. Mm -hmm. right. so, well, um, and the so star system. The star system is also changing, mm -hmm. so it might be helpful to know. How the star system is going to be changing, and so there will be two changes happening, and okay. then what's the end? Okay. So the information you're giving us is that the star system is changing. There, downstairs is not changing yet. No, DCF. No, DCF is changing. Making sure yeah. it's changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. It's a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Well, maybe I don't. Let me make sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> where, where the pre qualification section is there? Yep. Program kindergarten education. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it shall have received, and then it says A or mm -hmm. the four stars. Yep. So if they just have the the um, education, uh, the association. Uh, for education accreditation, they're okay. They don't have to have Correct. four stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that part of the law isn't changed under the proposal that's current being, currently being worked on. What's being changed is the elimination of the three star with a plan to come up to a fourth star. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at it again when we walk through the draft. We'll show you exactly where the changes are. Okay. Um, you might not have the answer to this, but uh, it mentions a process by which the tuition rate will be arrived at. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that process and how the two agencies work together to come up with that number? I don't, in terms of like on the ground, no. If there are rules that has to work together to do it, right. in terms of how they do it, I'm not sure. Okay. This is so abnormal. Um, I know that the cost of education is higher per pupil, for instance, in South Burlington than it might be in some other town. So I am assuming that the cost of, is it fair to assume that the cost of pre-K, public and public, is going to be different in different uh, districts. Should be. Uh, there, there are reasons for it to be, uh, based upon all the usual cost factors. Okay, so in, in other yeah. words, the differences that, that, that um, relate to the per-pupil cost or whatever it is in grades 1 through 12, those same parameters are in place for pre-K. Now, Carl, don't, or James, don't get mad at me, but assuming that um, I live in Georgia or Milton. I don't live in Milton. Where do you live? Definitely not Milton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I live in Fairfield. Okay, so I mean, assuming I live in one of those places, but I work Vermont. at the University of Vermont. So I want my kid to go to the pre K program that is embedded in South in South Burlington yep. because it's right near where I'm going to be working. Yep. The cost of that is a bit more than in Georgia or Fairfax. Field. Field. Fairfield. Field. Yeah. <laughs> right. Maybe in two years I'll get Who was the first person to ask if you were all right over the weekend? You <laughs> <laughs> can never remember where I live. <laughs> no one else cares. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, how, how do we, who's paying the difference? Well, it goes, the cost of pre K um, goes into the school budget for whatever school is offering pre K. 
pre-K is not required to be offered by public schools, but if they do, the cost goes into the, into the school budget. So there will be differences among school budgets based upon different cost factors, but whatever that cost is will be absorbed by the taxpayers. And they're not like in Ann's situation, um, the South Burlington pre-K is not required to take that student. Is that correct? Okay. Well, that's interesting, actually, because the uh, current law uh, allows you to enroll your student in any, any public program in the state unless you have the geographical, geographic restriction, which we'll come to later on, which is only two in the state. But yes, basically, you can, you can go anywhere in the state, but that program in Burlington would have to have space. That's what I mean. And, and there's something in, in, in the current law or in the new version, the new draft, that deals with how space gets allocated. Um, so I'm not sure how that's actually done in practice, but there has to be space for that student, obviously. Yeah. So if, I just want to make sure I understand. So if you're a three-star program right now, a private three-star program, but you have some preschool kids, you wouldn't be able to get any other choice. Is that what the change is? So the change is what quality standards are in place. So currently, if there is a pre-K program, that's being operated and the kids, they are currently receiving um, the, the publicly funded tuition and that program is three stars with a plan to come into compliance and get the fourth star, then that program would no longer be eligible under the new proposal. Yes. So, but, okay. In other words, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just interpret. And so it would be great to know how many kids yeah. that yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. Okay. That was the proposal two years ago by the AHS, was to get rid of three stars. Would um, be what? I'm sorry. Yeah, two years ago when we, we talked about this, uh, AHS proposed to get rid of three, three, three stars. That was their, I think, their idea. Mm -hmm. That was two years ago. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think we're ready to go into okay. rulemaking. Okay. That's really important. It, it uh, okay. is. Okay. Where are we here? We so. Are, uh, we're on subsection E. Um, so it's worth just taking a step back to kind of think about the big picture of how the existing law is different from the proposal. So the existing law has joint rulemaking between AOE and AHS and joint oversight. Whereas the new language that's being worked on downstairs has joint rulemaking between the two agencies but separate oversight. So that's what you're going to kind of see in terms of changes in the language. But I think conceptually that is what's happening here. So current law, joint oversight, um, joint rulemaking. Um, so, so this says joint rulemaking already. Yep. And have there been rules? There have been rules yeah. mm -hmm. promulgated that were jointly developed and all that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, I'm sorry. I still, what, what's the second part of that? Is the supervision now? Uh, it would be so split, the, right? Under the language that House Education is working on, yes. Yeah. yeah. But now, I mean, how is that different from what it is now? Right now, it's joint oversight, joint rulemaking. Joint oversight. That doesn't seem what we've been hearing, that it's joint oversight, because there seems to be, that's where we're putting conflict, it seems like. Well, it's what schools mostly are complaining about. They have to respond to AHS and they have to respond to yeah. AOE. So they would they would technically have their own little universe. Yeah. But they yeah. need to talk right. about what the rules right. are. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see how that plays out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds, sounds difficult. So in other words, under the, the proposed language that AHS would be overseeing the private programs and we would be overseeing the school. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, the one exception, I believe, is Head Start programs that, would, that are in schools would still be overseen by both agencies. And I was going to add CCFAP if there's... Right. Um, a, a, um, a school program. public program that is accepting CCFAP, then they're also subject to the yeah. CDD rules with regard to CCFAP. Thank you. Wouldn't it be most everyone? Yeah, how many is that? I mean, you'd be surprised really? that that is not a universal thing. Oh. Uh, What's that? I'm sorry. It's um, not all public schools 
um, are participating in CCFAP. CCFAP again stands for what? Child oh, care. the child care subsidy money, and they okay. or they might okay. be for their older students, but not necessarily for the pre-K age. Okay, so there's a long list of rules. I'll try to run through them quickly, but this is guidance as to what rules should be adopted and have been adopted jointly by AHS and AOE. So first we have allowing um, non-pre-qualified private providers to create or continue existing partnerships with school districts and the school district um, could provide supports to help um, fulfill requirements for teachers or in-kind payments. And subdivision two, allowing the district to begin or expand a pre-K program based on community need. Uh, subdivision three, rules requiring a school district to provide opportunities for effective parental participation. And subdivision four, establishing a process for parents to notify a district that the child is um, admitted to a non-district program and concurrently enroll in the district and also to establish a process for the district to pay tuition in a manner that allows the parent or guardian to enroll the child in a pre-K program or ability of a private provider to um, maintain financial stability and to enter agreements with a provider regarding tuition payments, quality, and assurances. In subdivision 4C, um, providing rules around provider notification to the district when a pre-K student who has been receiving public funds is no longer enrolled in the private program. In subdivision five, rules directing um, the establishment of a process to calculate statewide, statewide tuition rate based on cost of delivering 10 hours of pre-K a week. Subdivision seven, requiring identifiable pre-K costs and essential early education services and districts annual budgets. In subdivision eight, requiring an annual report um, from each district to AOE regarding annual pre-K expenditures. In subdivision nine, providing an administrative process for parents or school districts to challenge a particular action. In subdivision 10, uh, directing AOE and DCF to develop a system for joint monitoring and evaluation. And again, I'll kind of flag that because we'll um, start splitting apart that joint monitoring once we get in the new draft. Um, but the current joint monitoring, we have a, a list in 10 A through C. Um, so in subdivision A, what's part of the monitoring? It's uh, programmatic details, including the number of children served, the number of private and public programs operated, the public financial investment made to ensure access to quality pre-K, in subdivision B, it's quality of public and private pre-K education programs and efforts to ensure continuous quality improvements through mentoring, training, and technical assistance. And then in subdivision four, uh, results for children including school readiness and proficiency and numeracy and literacy. We're almost there, subdivision 11, um, directed rulemaking around a process for documenting student progress. Um, and the process would include helping to individualize instruction and improve program practice. And also to collect and report child progress data uh, to the Secretary of Education on an annual basis. Okay. And then F and uh, F. Uh, okay, quick question. Yeah. Um, I, I might not have heard it, and I haven't read this all, but is there any rulemaking with regard to access to special education services? Nothing, no, nothing here. In that. Okay. No, Thank you. no, no. Uh, sub F here uh, talks about um, disapplying uh, sections of law that deal with tuition payments because this has its own tuition payment structure embedded within it. Um, G says that nothing uh, here shall be construed to um, require public funds to be spent in a way that would violate the, the uh, separation of church and state. And then H is the geographical limitations, and this language won't go through it all, but basically allows um, school districts to narrow the geographical region in which you will make tuition payments. So while the principle of the, the, the section is you can take your child anywhere in the state uh, and, and use the voucher, this says no. Um, if a school district wants to limit the uh, geography in which you're going to make these payments, 
uh, to providers. They can do that, but there's a process for it, which includes a lot of engagement with human service, um, human services and AOE and input. And um, but if they do that, then what that means is wherever that region is, the district will only pay a public or a provi private provider that is within that, that geographical area. I believe there are only two areas in the state that have done this. Um, um, and then, I just a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the exception for whatever you call it, on the church and state separation. Yeah. Could you read that again? Yeah, so this set, the language says, nothing in this section shall be construed <coughs> to permit or require payment of public funds to a private provider of pre-K education in violation of the Constitution which is the separation of church and state. So, in other words, a private provider could not be a church, is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, well, couldn't be uh, um, a program that has a religious orientation where there aren't controls to ensure that the money's not being used yeah, for what, worship. Let's say they're using a church to hold a class in, but that's the only affiliation. Yeah. That would be our okay? I believe that would be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I wouldn't grow ahead. Yeah. It has to do with the use of public funds for worship, basically, uh, is where that issue is. Okay. Um, so let me back out of this for a minute and uh, just take you to two other areas of law. Um, here, uh, this is the definition of average daily membership. And uh, this is how you begin to come up, up with your equalized people uh, waiting, okay? Um, and uh, it says here in, in C that you include the, the district of residence includes the full-time equivalent enrollment for each pre-K child. So if the child is enrolled for 10 or more hours of pre-K education per week, um, they get a full count of one child, okay? Uh, but if they're enrolled between six and 10 hours, they get a proportion of one child. So say you're, you're giving six hours of, of pre-K, you get a child will count for six tenths, okay? That's the ADM count. So one count for 10 hours or more, and then proportional count between six and 10, and no count at all if it's under six hours. Wherever that figure is, then you multiply it by 0.46, because that is the next section, which is the weighting. So the weighting is here, and you'll see that um, uh, under C, pre-K is 0.46. So if you have a child who's getting 10 more hours a week, um, a pre-K, they'll be kind of at 0.46 for the purpose of equalized pupils, which affects tax rates. So the higher the count, the lower the tax rate. So that's the game. Um, okay. What? I'm sorry. The higher the higher the student count. The mm -hmm. lower the tax rate because it's per pupil spending is how, how it's done. Right? Did you say something about 0. 0.6 at one point, or is point. it all 0. 0.46? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Did you say 0. 0.6 at one time, no, or is sorry. it all 0. 0.46? Sorry, 0. 0.46. All of them. Yeah, okay. for pre-K. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're done talking about the current law. Any questions before we move on to the draft bill? Um, are pre-K students subject to the additional weights? like all other students are? Poverty, um, English yep. language. Learning. All other case adjusted. Okay. It, that's, yeah. There. Yeah, yeah, correct, yeah. Um, back on the, the base statute, um, there, was a, there was a section there where it said that the district was able to calculate the costs of pre-K and that they might differ from district to district. Um, I'm just trying to figure out if that was part of a, under what they could do under regulation or something, I think. Mm -hmm. How, um, uh, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is right now it seems, or my recollection is we pay a standard, the, there's a, a state set rate of what we will pay for pre-K and then it's determined somehow through magic how much the private pre-K people will get, which is roughly half of what goes out. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out what the relevance is of the cost, other than obviously it must be included in the district's budget. Yeah, so it's a really hard question, actually, because well, you, have the, you have two things happening. You have, on the one hand, school districts paying cash out of the school budget 
of let's say 3,400 bucks for that, those 10 hours. Okay, that's the outlay. They get as a benefit though to count that child at 0.46 in their ADM count. So you, some people have said, well, look, that's not fair because the 0.46 is basically half of the student. If the average per student cost in Vermont is, let's say, 15000 per student, there's a $7,500 tax benefit over here and a $3,500, $3,400 payment over here. So it seems like that's not fair. But I'm not sure how actually you compare a tax benefit to um, basically a, a grant, if you will. I'm not sure how they actually equate to each other, how you actually do that math. So I, the concept there that there is a difference here, how, how to value that difference, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it's a question for JFO to work through a bit. So there isn't any, or is there, I should add, is there any, um, since we're talking about AHS and AOE splitting out supervision, is there any concept of splitting out payment and just having AHS make grant payments to private pre-Ks? So, Two years ago, um, the proposal was to bring all the payment at the state level, at the state right? level up to AOE, actually. Yeah. Um, but the version <laughs> we're about to go through doesn't do that. Uh, there's a recognition that it's very burdensome for school districts to have to pay all these different providers and ha having to um, deal with contracts, invoicing, and things. So the draft we're about to go through uh, adopts a uniform approach to that process as opposed to bringing it up to the state level. This is something I should get from testimony, but maybe you've heard it. It's burdensome from, for school districts to have to deal with so many providers. Um, is there an average? Like, how many is too many? I don't know. I don't know what the average is. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, is it, is it, you know, two or three? Or is it 10? Yeah. Um, I think it's more like 10, but you have to take testimony because I don't, I don't have those figures. Okay, so maybe that's something. Yeah. Um, I only ask that, not that it's not burdensome, but in our world, um, the equivalent to a public school might be a community mental health center or a private nonprofit agency like a <coughs> child care, a parent child care center. And oh, they have to report to, they have to turn in grant stuff and report to a boatload of um, agencies or even the same agency, but four or five different reporting things. So um, that's all I'm going to say. Should we go to the draft bill? Are we ready to move? Okay. Um, is going to be up here. Okay, so a couple comments about this draft. So we're on draft 3.1 here. Um, this draft does not reflect um, very much community discussion at this point. It doesn't reflect testimony they've heard either. So it's a pretty early draft of this of this language. Um, I'm sorry. Can you, it doesn't reflect. We we just went through this with another bill. <coughs> that we were doing, which are put draft language yeah. up there. Where it hasn't had discussion, but I mean, was there a committee member in charge of doing this or is yeah. this the yeah. um, the sort of the garbage can of every idea is here and we're gonna No, that? it's actually been a much more controlled process. So I've worked with um, Rep Web <laughs> Well, Rep I won't take that personally. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I didn't mean to be personal. Okay. Um, um, no, it's, it's been controlled in the sense that um, it's been funneled through Rep Reb, Rep Conman, and Rep Coopley as the people working with, with KEI in this language. Okay. And we talked about it in committee, of course, uh, but they haven't had like a session yet that I've been at where they've actually started to, to think about how to change this or whatever. Um, and there's been quite a bit of testimony on this language that hasn't been, been talked about yet in committee uh, formally. So I'm just giving you a, a sense for where it stands uh, as we talk to you about this. Um, the, um, <coughs> in terms of the oversight 
question. Um, the bill, there's three main things. So the statement of purpose is to eliminate joint regulatory oversight um, by the uh, two agencies, um, to require that tuition payments for pre-K use a uniform form of process, um, and to simplify and clarify the, uh, the program quality uh, criteria, the three stars, et cetera. On the first one, just to mention, uh, we talked as well with House Education. In my mind, uh, these, um, and there might be more than this, but I think there are five options for oversight. Let me just lay them out there so we have that in mind, maybe. One is you have all the oversight of pre-K by AOE. One is you have it all by a AHS. We aren't doing that in this, this draft here. One is, the third option is to have joint oversight and joint rulemaking. That's what the current law is, okay? Uh, and then another option to have separate oversight and separate rulemaking. We tried that in an earlier draft, but then we realized, or we didn't realize, but the committee realized, you have to keep those two sets of rules in line all the time. So why not have joint rulemaking? So the, the fifth option is to have separate oversight and joint rulemaking, which is what this draft does. Okay, okay so going through the draft, um, first thing we'll come to this definition of pre-K child. I'll read this to you. It says, pre-K child means a child who, as of the date established by the District of Residence for uh, Kindergarten Eligibility, is three or four years of age, or is five years of age, but is not yet eligible to be enrolled, enrolled in kindergarten, um, or five years of age, but is not yet enrolled in kindergarten if the child is on a 504 plan or IEP. So that's changing, that's clarifying the current language um, basically to exclude five-year-olds, um, generally from the voucher, um, unless you're on IP or a 504 plan. And five years of age, we don't care what month? Uh, it's, it is, based upon eligibility for enrollment in, in, in kindergarten. So wherever that cutoff date is for that and district. And the cutoff date is the same across the state. So I think for kindergarten, we're we'll looking at the industry language here. Uh, it says, as of a date established by the district for kindergarten. So I believe kindergarten must be based upon local decisions as to what that date is. Um, so what, so, um, <coughs> And I am eligible for first grade no matter how old I am if I have gone to kindergarten. Uh, yeah, well, I have to check the rules on that for you. Okay, just, I mean, I'm just meaning, you yeah. know, so if, I, if my school district says, oh, it's okay for you to enter kindergarten if you were born in a month that's an early, in the earlier part, like really early. But I, I, I love my kid, and my kid's really smart, so I want my kid to be in kindergarten. But the kid's probably younger than what many of us think of as kindergarten. So they go into first grade at basically five. And they automatically get to go to first grade because they were in kindergarten. And that's possible? Well, I'm not sure. I don't think yes. so. I'm not sure. No, I mean, at least in my district, I know many people who felt their child was ready to go, and they were hard and fast about that. Even though I was in kindergarten? Yes. Sometimes yes. you can go twice. Yeah. Pardon me? I don't know about kindergarten, but you used to go to preschool twice. Well, I'm, try I'm trying to see if there's a difference between pre-K and kindergarten yeah. and first grade. Um, in question. terms of what gets to be local control. Right versus what is a statewide, and, um, and and that might influence my views of what needs to change. I mean, I yeah. think other things need to change, but if it's all local for everything, mm -hmm. right. then I'm not going to, you know. But if it's, if it's, um, if it is something that the, the State Board of Education or whatever has done uniformly, for everybody else, every other thing. I might go, well, why aren't we doing it for this? I think really? there's also local control for when a child turns three mm -hmm. and can be in a public school. You mean 
setting. Oh, pre-K? Yeah. I think we did hear that because when we looked yeah, at the there report, were some, there were two-year-olds. There were some two-year-olds attending. Yeah, yeah. I know. It boggles my mind. And, and I don't know if they were all attending public school programs or if they were also getting vouchers to be in privates, but there were two-year-olds who were a part of the... Mm. Well, let me take that question away. I'll come back to it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, definition of pre-K education is unchanged. Okay, and then we come to where we had language about uh, pre-qualified and now we're kind of striking through, we're, we're moving away from the concept of pre-qualification. But now we have a definition of just a private provider and that um, is somebody who's either a, regulated as a center-based child care program or a family child care home. Okay, and then we have a definition of a public provider, which means a provider of pre-K education that is a school district. Uh, that meets program quality requirements under section we're about to come to shortly. So this is the same, nothing's changed here. So in terms of 35, um, 10 hours per week, 35 weeks a year, the way tuition payments work, all the same as before. So again, the district of residents will pay tuition to a public provider, a private provider, as a parent's choice. Um, a student will be enrolled in the district of residence program only for purposes of um, if they're being paid away for purposes of, of the ADM count. That hasn't changed either. It's still 0.46. So all this mechanics are all the same in terms of th this area here. Um, no good question. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I got, I got a little lost. So. Um, my, I, I, I live in Rochester. Um, I'm taking my kid to Randolph. So, so the school is paying for Randolph. Is my kid counted in the ADM for both schools? No. One, one's paying and one's receiving? No, only the, the home district. Only the home district is yeah. paying. Is getting the, the ADM credit. It, get, okay, so my school gets, uh, Rochester gets the ADM, and Randolph gets thirty four hundred dollars Correct. Okay. Correct. Is that correct? So actually, um, okay, what does, what, what value, plus or minus, to Rochester is getting the ADM? That's the question we, we, we were talking about earlier. The, the, va the, the values of Rochester is a 0.46 count uh, for ADM purposes, tax rate. Right. Right. which will lower the tax rate for Rochester. All things being equal. So you would like that? Just send all of your. We have a great pre-K program in Rochester. Yes, but don't you want lower taxes? <laughs> no. What? Clearly, we don't quite want this to share. Um, so, if it, uh, this might just be a nuance, but so uh, in in uh, Sandy's uh, example, let's just presume that the um, the student was going um, into a public provider, now not public school program, public provider. Yeah. Um, they still only get the thirty-four hundred dollars from the sending school Correct. district. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's regardless of whether it goes to a public provider or a private Correct. provider out of district. Correct. Okay. Yep. Yep. Correct. Yep. Yep. Um, there are some changes in this uh, subdivision four here. Uh, the original uh, language uh, in law now contemplates there might be a um, lack of supply um, of um, providers. Um, so this talks about how you uh, deal with a lack of supply and that kind of partnership with um, Building Right Futures. That's been taken away, I guess, in the view that there's enough supply. Um, the language now says nothing in this section should be construed to require the state or district to begin or expand pre-K education program uh, to satisfy demand for pre-K education. And then it says, if a district plans to begin or expand a public pre-K education program, it shall, not less than 30 days prior to the date of commencement or expansion of the program, notify in writing the public and private providers with which it has contracted to provide pre-K education. So the idea being there's some notification to people locally 
um, or with people you contracted with that you're about to expand your program or start one? Okay. So our next is subsection C, which had been pre-qualification. You can see that language is struck through. But then on line 19, we have the, the new lead-in language being provider qualification, and the question came up downstairs. What is the difference between pre-qualification and just qualification? And I think that's a fair question, and the, the best answer we have is we base this off the um, AOE and AHS proposal that came over two years ago. Yeah, um, so that was, that was the basis of, of what, where we were drafting from. Uh, regardless, the section deals with the qualifications that we had been um, speaking about with regard to the existing law. And on the top of page five, with regard to the private provider, um, we still um, say that the private provider shall meet the minimum program quality by having the NACI accreditation, so same as the existing law, or at least four stars similar to the existing law, except we're striking through that we have to have two points in each of the five arenas. So that specificity is gone. Instead, it's just having four stars. Um, and then you'll see that subdivision C, which was the three stars with the plan to come into compliance, or I hate to say compliance, uh, come up to the fourth star, um, that, that goes away under this particular proposal. And then uh, we have an and. In subdivision two, um, a private provider shall also employer contract for the services of at least one teacher to provide direct instruction to pre-K student um, who is either licensed in early childhood ed or special ed um, or has a Montessori early child um, childhood teacher certification. So two things there. First, the language on line 18 about the uh, Montessori Early Childhood Teacher Certification, that is new from the previous draft. The previous draft didn't include that. The previous draft just had licensed teachers with either um, uh, early childhood or early uh, special education, early childhood special education um, license. And then the second thing that is worth pointing out here is on line 15, um, there's the phrase that the teacher is to provide direct instruction. So if you remember from the existing law when we went over it, we talked about an option for training and supervision, and there wasn't language about direct supervision. Um, so this draft, as written, would require direct supervision. However, at the very end of this draft, there's a standalone section that says that they're um, it takes. It gives um, private providers three years to come into compliance with this, so that they wouldn't have to have a teacher licensed um, as specified, providing direct instruction um, for three years. Instead, we'll look at the language with more specificity, but it allows um, both direct instruction during that three-year period, but also coaching from a licensed teacher. So that's a change from the previous or from the existing law. So, um, the addition of, uh, I'm I guess curious about the addition of Montessori mm -hmm. and, um, and, or I can tell you that probably everybody here got the same letter I did about the Waldorf School. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering if there was discussion about that. Yeah, can I, can I answer the question? <laughs> yes, there was. Um, and while there wasn't any vote on changing the language, it kind of, the, after the last discussion landed at maybe we should just stick with licensed teachers. Yeah, mm. that'd be a good idea. Mm. That if you, if you one, just stick with licensed, licensed teachers, because if you name one specific right. um, philosophy of education that has a certification process, there are others. There are others. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there was discussion about that, and Thank that you. was where the last discussion landed, but the language hasn't been changed, mm. and I mean, who knows? If and when it will be, but that's where the last discussion. We'll get to our tip about that. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I just would concur. I, I wonder right. why that had been pulled out as a unique example. So I um, um, I got to visit a couple of programs, and um, and when I said, so when are you doing pre-K, and when are you just taking care of kids? They said we're doing everything all the time, and I'm reading at the bottom of page five, uh, during the hours in which pre-kindergarten education 
is paid for with publicly funded tuition. So, so at 10:30 you need a tutor, but at 9:30 you don't. I mean, I, mm. they're doing the same stuff. <laughs> they're playing, they're building things. Okay. That, that, right. Uh, I don't. I don't mind chiming in. I feel like you two are, can't. You can't speak to what the conversation is so much, right? You're just speaking about what. So there's also a bit of conversation about that, although no real um, acknowledgement of it being a challenge. Um, so aside from the fact that it's going to take time to have any enough workforce to have every private provider even the ability to hire licensed teachers. There's also a question of uh, if that's the expectation, those licensed teachers are likely going to need to be paid more. Because they'll be working after school. Right. In the after school activities. <laughs> so if we're going to pay them more, it is likely going to lead to an increase in tuition rates at private providers. And then there's a whole domino effect of what that looks like in terms of the voucher amount, um, as well as what child care subsidy amounts, because that's all rate-based, um, which then leads to more questions about affordability for families who need both the tuition and the subsidy to be able to send their children to high quality programs. Yeah. So um, I would say that's been brought up, but not uh, thoroughly discussed. Well, we already have an unequal system because we, the taxpayers, already subsidize the public school costs for pre-K completely. And in a situation like this, where the in, in the tuition payment or whatever it's called, the right. doesn't increase, then that's unequal access to pre-K for those selecting a private provider. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I was handed. Sure I and thank you. And I don't know if we, this is something that a I can keep and should no. probably share. Okay. Um, how that tuition. Um, dollar amount is arrived at, um, which is helpful to look at, um, and maybe it would be helpful to hear some testimony about mm -hmm. that. Um, so as rates go up, presumably the voucher amount would also go up based on what I was reading about that process. Um, but it adds to the overall cost. Um, and I think clearly creates some issues around access and, and equity, too. So, um, yeah. As a, as a process for the committee, I believe things are always changing, but I believe it's similar to the bill about lead. We will actually, which <clears throat> came to us so that we got more than a drive by, but we, the committee came to a consensus about it that we would um, actually have get this bill to, to do things. The idea, part of my idea of having a run through now is so that we can see what our questions are, so that perhaps we can have some conversations with the three people who were putting, doing most of the work on it, it appears, um, in terms of where we are so that the two committees aren't necessarily, at least we're on the same path. We may not necessarily come to the exact same conclusions, but let's, let's <coughs> know, know where our paths are or aren't, mm -hmm. or where, where our questions are. <coughs> Are you ready? Ready. Um, okay, so we were on the language that um, talks about the direct instruction, um, either employing or contracting with the services of a teacher. And then in um, Roman numeral one, the private provider that's regulated as a center-based program. Um, 
the hours that are publicly funded are the, the 10 hours, whereas at the top of page six, um, the private provider that's the family child care home, um, the teacher is required to be there for at least three hours per week. So, um, yeah. Okay. okay, and then we come to the um, program quality requirements for a public provider, so a school district. Um, and on line six it says, employing or contracting for the services of at least one teacher who is licensed and endorsed, etc., to provide direct instruction to pre-K uh, students during the hours of operation of the program. So, just to contrast that, so if you're in a uh, public program, you have to have a qualified teacher there all day for the entire length of the program. Um, and as Katie mentioned, if you're a private program, 10 hours for center-based and three hours for home-based. So the difference is there, obviously, in terms of the requirements to have a um, licensed teacher. And two, um, the public, public uh, provider has to meet safety and quality rules adopted by the State Board of Education. We'll come back to that because later you'll see that those rules have to be aligned to the rules um, by HS. Um, so we'll come back to that. Um, okay. um, in subdivision 2A, this directs that the um, Agency of Human Services is, is to maintain and post on its website a list of private providers that satisfy all the program requirements that we just went over, <laughs> and that the private provider that a private provider who no longer satisfies one or more of the requirements is required to notify in writing AHS um, within five calendar days um, of an event that would cause it not to be in compliance with the requirements. So for example, um, the teacher that the family child care home had been contracting with um, <laughs> gives notice that he or she can no longer provide um, instruction or training then the private provider would have five days to <laughs> get in touch in writing with AHS to let them know that they're no longer in compliance. And, and we actually had somebody testify last year that she something happened in her private, um, uh, some private provider's place um, that made her lose a star. So mm -hmm. she fell from four stars to three stars. So she would have to close or at least not be able to do that. Okay. So I may have missed it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> James, in terms of what you were going through. But okay, so I'm the private provider and I have to notify AHS if something has happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm a public provider. Um, who do I have to notify when... Um, you anticipated the next paragraph. So you'll notice that there's almost identical language in subdivision B. So this again is the idea of separate um, oversight. So the Agency of Education um, shall maintain and post on its website a list of public providers that satisfy its program quality requirements. So. Um, separate posting of qualified programs on two different agencies' websites, depending on whether they're private or public. A public provider that no longer satisfies one or more um, requirements shall notify, notify in writing AOE and the public providers with which it has contracted to provide pre-K education within five calendar days after an event causing noncompliance. Can I, just, uh, um, in terms of a public provider, my understanding is in terms of public schools, they might, does everyone who works in the building, forget pre-K, everyone who works in the building, do they have to be a, some kind of certified teacher? Do they ever, do public schools, can public schools like contract with, um, I don't know, a jazz musician to come in and um, teach jazz? I believe so because the requirements for screening applies both to employees and contractor workers. So that tells me that yes, a school can hire a contractor worker or teacher to come in for a period. But, I, mean, I mean, I guess my question, the reason I was asking the question is let's say I'm a public school <clears throat> and um, 
rather than creating my own private pre-K program. The public school <coughs> contracts with the Ann Pew um, Child Care Center to be the South Burlington pre-K program. Is that a public program? Because, and, and they're paying, I mean, is that a public program or a private program? It's a really good question. Um, it, it can't be a, it can't be by definition in this draft, I don't believe that can be itself a public program because a public program or a provider is defined as a school district. So the school district is my employer. Uh, so if you're bringing in a private provider, I assume that's a contractual arrangement that you're bringing in. Um, well, you know, I mean, and, and, and if I'm going down a rabbit hole that doesn't exist, you can say, and it doesn't exist. But I'm just trying to figure out who are these private pre-K, I mean, who are these, hmm. these, these what is a public pre-K program? Oh, oh public, <laughs> that could be just your program here in Montpelier. So if it's the Montpelier uh, school, um, the only elementary school offers a pre-K program. That's a, a public program. And I guess my, and d does this exist anywhere? And if it doesn't, I will ignore this. Where a public school offers private pre-K, but the way they offer it is they have contracted with me. Yeah, I think Ludlow oh, yeah, has does. one. Yeah. Ludlow has, they rent yes. space in from, the they rent the classroom, rent right. they rent the old first grade room. Right. Yeah. And it's a private program. But it's a private program right. that exists inside a public school. Yeah. Right. I believe, by the way, it's still a private program. Private, yeah. 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 Y
Can different school districts charge different tuitions? Uh, not for the not for the towers. The towers is 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 set by the by rule by the agency. So that's the, the thirty four hundred bucks. That's the same for everybody. So that's different than what is I don't know what you call it. Um, uh, people in in Georgia, right? You don't have a high school, right? Right. And so kids in Georgia can go to South Burlington or Essex or whatever. And I don't believe. Do they pay the exact? Does Georgia pay the exact same thing for those kids, or do they pay? We pay different? the uh, average of three surrounding high schools. I think they they calculate, mm -hmm. or, okay. or it is the tuition for South Carolina. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think it's a blended. Oh, so they take, they take the average. Yeah. Well, for this purpose, though, for the towers, uh, pre-K, it's the the, the standard. standard rate. Right. I'm just trying to see what is different and what is the same. If we are, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just curious. Yep. Yep. It's yep. none of my business. I'm in human services, not downstairs. But if um, if we blend the rates for other other parts of education, why are we not blending the rates for the potential, and maybe that's what the 300 or whatever it is. Well, it's, it's the rulemaking that Kay went through. Um, I believe it allows that rate to be set regionally. So you have differences okay. in that rate. I don't believe it's different yeah. regionally. Yeah. I think it's the same, but it can be done regionally uh, by, by law. Um, okay. But, so some um, pre-Ks are, are all day. So I'm I sent my I'm sending my kid to an all day. Yeah. Does they get the thirty six hundred? Do they get or thirty four hundred? Whatever. Okay. Do they get anything else? Yeah, whatever the program charges for the additional hours, it's wherever their, their rate is. Even in public school. Uh, well, that's that's the point. So today, uh, for the private providers, they can charge additional right. money for the additional hours. Right. For a public school can't do that today, okay? They cannot do that. But in this draft, which we accepted over actually, um, it allows, um, so here I still like, not just seeing it. it, says a private provider, now it says, or a public provider that is not the child's district of residence may receive additional payments directly from the parent or guardian um, only for the pre-K education and excess of the public funded hours. Um, so now this bill is saying if you're a public provider, not the district of residence, so if you're a Montpelier and you're sending your child to a public provider in Burlington, they can charge now <coughs> this draft for those additional hours, whereas they couldn't yeah. before. To the family. Yeah. 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 Completely not parity with the privates, if you will. And, how, and is that in this draft, is, is, is the school board? Um, can they set any number they want to for that, or is there any? Are there any? Are there any? Is there any frame around what they can do? Not this draft, no. no. Nor on the private side, they have discretion. Okay. Okay. So we are. We got two five A and B. Um, two I six. Um, it's still you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is the board of the supervisory union that has a member district that is a public provider shall adopt, uh, adopt uh, a monitoring policy that covers the public provider's pre-K education program that complies with state board rules. What this is saying is trying to move the monitoring function not just up at the AOE and AHF level, but down to the supervisory union level. So SUs are responsible for adopting a monitoring policy of their own public pre-K programs. That's what that's saying. And then seven um, says that um, a school district that pays tuition for pre-K education under this section shall be responsible for ensuring that the provider is on the list maintained by the Agency of Human Services or the Agency of Education, which Katie went through, uh, but shall have no responsibility to monitor the administration of pre-K educational services provided by public or private provider and should it be immune from civil and criminal liability and penalties for acts and omissions of the public or private providers, administration, and pre-K educational services. So today we have um, it's a situation where 
the school district of residence is contracting with, let's say, five or ten, whatever, other programs. Um, in that contract, there's a requirement to monitor those programs. So that one school district is monitoring all these programs, and another school district is saying, okay, the same programs is monitoring those programs. And so this is saying, no, the school district of residence doesn't have to monitor the programs. That's done by the Agency of Education for Publics. That's done by HS for Privates. And school districts basically are, are off the hook from trying to monitor these programs. Uh, and because of that monitoring, they can't be sued for not monitoring. Uh, so, so, who, so who is monitoring them? So the monitoring is done, uh, we have separate oversight by AHS and AOE. AHS is monitoring privates, AOE is monitoring publics. So the local school, so the agency of education, so state government yeah. is, is um, liable except that state government employees, right, are immune. Right? Right? What? Right. Oh, I mean, I thought there was something you can't sue a state employee doing their job. There, there are sovereignty and immunity provisions in law, that's correct. I'm not sure how they work exactly. In this case, but, yeah. uh, is this similar to what happens in first, second, or third grade? Um, when I when my kids <coughs> go to a specialized school because they need special things. <laughs> or when they send my when, when you send your grandchild who's living with you to South Burlington? So that's a popular question. <laughs> the, um, well, no, I mean, this is and something happens. No, I mean, right. that's, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. Um, the, yeah, so the, in the context of special needs, like special well, Okay, needs. we'll forget the special needs. Okay, there you go. Know. More complicated. So, so your question is, outside the pre-K context, mm -hmm. if a child is in like first grade or second grade and gets sent to... So, so this is another thing where this is the sending school, yeah. the school of residence, and, I'm, and the child is not going to, not participating in something yeah. in the school of residence, but rather is um, somewhere else. Yeah. Um, is Georgia, I'm just trying to back, have no responsibility to monitor the administration and are, is, is Georgia immune from civil and criminal liability or penalties? I think in, for those lower grades, they'd have to pay tuition to Lake South Carolina. Mm -hmm. yeah. The I only, just, only place where... She's just being theoretical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think the answer is no, it's not similar. Um, this is different than that in terms of <coughs> the language here. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're a tuition, tuition in town, for example, and you're, you're paying tuition to um, there's no immunity from liability there. That I, I'm not sure if there's any responsibility to, okay. to monitor either um, there. Okay, so Kelly, a question I will have <laughs> it, it is, well, why, why are things different for pre-K than they are for kindergarten through 12? <clears throat> Whether it's this or other things in terms of yeah. This is going to be public school. So next we have subsection E. It previously was just a subsection on rules, and now you'll see we have language about regulatory oversight. We have a new subdivision one in here. And this basically is just two paragraphs. This is which agency is overseeing which programs. So in um, paragraph 1A, the Agency of Education has sole regulatory oversight of a pre-K program offered by a public provider, provided that if the public provider participates in CCFAP, AHS shall have regulatory oversight over the provider's compliance with, with CCFAP. And then uh, conversely in paragraph B, DCF has sole regulatory oversight of a pre-K program offered by a private provider. And then we go into the rules, and the rules are still jointly made as they are in existing law. Um, so, you know, okay, can we go back up because it's public school? <clears throat> because it's public, um, I have to take um, I have to take all children who fit. I can't say no. I don't want to take you because you're receiving childcare financial assistance. Okay, 
Most of the rules are the same, so I don't think I need to put it um, at the bottom of page 13. Yep, at the bottom of page 13. Um, this is the monitoring. So we're still under rulemaking that we have to have joint rulemaking. And in subdivision H, we now have to establish comparable systems by which AOE and DCF monitor. Previously, it was joint monitoring. Um, and they evaluate the implementation of publicly funded pre-K programs under their respective jurisdictions. So again, um, comparable systems. And then at, at the top of page 14, they're um, jointly reporting on the results of their monitoring, even though there's the AOE and HS are separately monitoring. And another difference, um, as we go through this subdivision H um, on line seven, it says at a minimum, the system shall monitor and evaluate. And then we have the same list that we had before, the different things that are being monitored for, except in um, subdivision three on line 14, the results for children, including school readiness and proficiency in numeracy and literacy, there's an addition of social and emotional development. So that's new from the previous draft. Um, I'm just going to mention that there is a presentation of what um, the joint monitoring system, which took many years to um, build and has just very recently um, been stood up. I think it was October that it, they started. There was like a soft, you know, start to it. Um, and so there's a there was a lot of concern that monitoring wasn't being done adequately um, by either agency or as a joint endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, but it's because they were building a system, and the system has just started to function. Um, you know, that may not be adequate for some people, but the the lack of a sense of monitoring was because it wasn't being fully um, done and implemented. So I just wanted to add that to everyone's thinking that they're thinking about the possibility of bifurcation and um, what two sets of monitoring look like. Sandy. So am I correct that we're still in rulemaking, so they're going to have to come up with rules for how to do this? Well, we, under the existing law, we um, have joint rulemaking authority, and they've already adopted joint rules. Many of the rules are the same, and this draft also requires joint rulemaking. So to the extent they're the same, they're already in place. To the extent there are changes, yes. Then so I guess, I, I guess my question, I, I think I love that we're asking about social and emotional development. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you measure that. I mean, a lot of this is, you know, how many kids, how many programs, it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty pretty basic stuff, and I'm assuming that proficiency and literacy and numeracy is probably done by testing. Um, but um, Or performance-based. But learning. I'm just, I mean, I, okay. So I'm just, I'm going to be interested to see what they come up with and how they measure social and emotional. There's a new paragraph at the end of the rulemaking section, and it basically says that um, in proposing and adopting rules under um, E, the Agency of Education or State Board of Education and the Department um, for Children and Families are to seek to ensure that the rules that apply to public and private providers are aligned. And then we have this kind of similar language again, except to the extent there are compelling reasons that are unique to a public or private provider environment that justify applying different requirements. And then uh, the um F and G uh, and H are really unchanged. Um, so F dealt with the uh, disciplinary tuition section. G was the separation of powers. H is the geographic, geographic limit, uh, limitations. So you can still create a geographical region under this bill. Um, the only change is here is straight up the words pre 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 um, And then we come to section two. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. We good thing you didn't wait. Right, I know. Final. So section two, we're now in Title Thirty Three, um, and this language in existing law um, says 
um, what a child care facility um, that a child care facility needs a license to operate or to be registered um, if it, in the case of a family or child care home. And then there's in subsection B a list of exceptions when you don't need a license. And when we move to the top of 18, there's can, a new can item. Can I ask, what is a 21st century mm -hmm. fund? Is that a federal grant that went away? No. It's ongoing. I don't know the answer to that. My understanding is it's ongoing. It's ongoing? That's what I've heard from local people. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. Um, so that's the item on the list of exceptions, subdivision six, a, pipe, a public provider of pre-K education unless the public provider participates in CCFAP. So, so um, the, the, I'm sorry, I'm a public provider and I'm participating in CFAP. And I'm also getting the $3,400. So I'm getting double. Well, I'm getting the $3,400 plus. I'm trying to figure out what the schools the are, are, have access right, the public providers to CPAP. Their, their school budget is funding the pre-K program. And then if they're also providing after school or a longer, longer, day. longer day that isn't considered their pre-K program, okay. and they're offering child care assistance to people. OK. OK, thank you. I just wanted to was yeah. But uh, if I'm a public provider and only doing 10 hours a week, and the participants, families who are there are also eligible for CFAP. The public provider doesn't get any of that CFAP. Not if it's only 10 hours. If it's only 10 hours. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, section 3, I mentioned that the issue around that definition of um, who qualifies for pre-K, four, five, three, four, five year olds. So there's another section of law that is conflicting. So this makes the same change we went through earlier uh, in another section of law to make it conform. So all this is doing is saying what we said before, basically pre-K is for three or four year olds and for five year olds if you're on an IEP or five program. Um, and then section four is a piece of section law. Uh, it requires that the uh, Secretary of Education develop and post on its website the uniform forms and processes um, for contracting and invoicing, et cetera, as we talked about earlier. Um, and then section five says that the secretary will develop and post on its website a mild pre-K monitoring policy for supervisory unit units to adopt. So, so in terms of how this plays out, for the 10 hours that is publicly funded pre-K, There'll be uniform stuff. Hour 11 through 35, um, they turn into um, a, a childcare. And so then they have different monitoring forms. Uh, well, the uniform stuff is basically all the other tracking uh, and payment process between the school district and the private provider. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Okay. Can I just ask a clarifying question? So that pre-kindergarten monitoring policy, I'm, uh, I'm confused. Is this only for the public programs? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. And is it, the way it's worded, it sounds like it's developing a policy for supervisory unions to implement. Exactly. Correct. But I thought supervisory unions weren't going to have monitoring of... No, monitoring their own programs. So they'll have their own programs. And so what basically this is saying is, in addition to AOE, monitoring public programs, if you have a public program in your supervisory union, the supervisory union board has to monitor its own programs as well. So, and is that an outdated term, supervisory union? No. Mm -hmm. 
We have a unified union board. Is that the same thing? Uh, well, it's, it's a little confusing. Supervisory uh. unions are on top of two or more school districts. Okay, um, so we have a number of those. We have 51, I believe, in the state. Um, but some uh, school district, districts are big enough on their own to be their own SU, which is really confusing. <laughs> Right, um, but if a, if a, I think Burlington is one of them, maybe. But it's Burlington, South yeah. Burlington. So it's called a supervisory district. So when it's supposed to perform the, the the function of a school district and a supervisory union, it's called a su supervisory district, and basically it's providing both the, both those functions because there's a different <laughs> system to do it without a supervisor. Georgia, Georgia, or you know, uh, we're part of a supervisory. What was the union? Union, union right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we used to be called Washington West Supervisory Union, but now we're called our union unified union school district. <laughs> <laughs> really, there's two U's. Unified <laughs> union. <laughs> and a school district, not a supervisory union. Yeah, then that exists under a new SU. I don't know. We don't, we don't pass any SU budgets anymore or anything. I don't know. That's, that's okay. a different conversation, sorry. If we can handle this, we've got three more pages. <laughs> <laughs> and the okay. last page is short. <laughs> so next is section six, and this um, has to do with safety and quality requirements. Um, and there has been some discussion about which safety and quality requirements do we follow? Do we follow AOEs or AHSs? Um, so this gives a little instruction that the safety and quality requirements that are required under this act to be adopted for public providers of pre-K education shall be aligned with CDC, CDD rules um, that apply to private providers of pre-K education unless, same language, there are compelling reasons unique to the public environment that justify um, different requirements. Yeah. Who so, it's, that? so it's saying <laughs> align uh, public programs align with CDC regulations around health and safety. Except when we don't want to. Except for when we don't want to do it, right. Except for specific circumstances. <laughs> and is there, well, I've looked it's at me, but serious is, is there anywhere else in rule or guidance or state law where compelling reasons consistent with being a public school are outlined or are um, identified or is that to be determined? No, I don't think anything right now. Okay. Right now, yeah. I didn't know if this was an existing sort of thing. That, okay. okay, we're nearly at the end. Yeah. Section seven. So this is the language I sort of previewed earlier um, with regard to teachers and how um, we talked about the direct instruction provided by teachers in the draft, um, direct instruction um, of licensed teachers for both uh, center-based and family child care home for the 10 hours or the three hours um, respectively. And we talked about how that wasn't going to apply just yet um, and that there was going to be kind of a, a grace period where there was a, um, a little bit more flexibility for the private providers to come into compliance. So that's what this language is. That notwithstanding that language that we went over earlier, um, the private pre-K provider um, employee that's being employed or contracted for services with at least one qualified teacher to provide direct educational instruction a private provider may use the services of a qualified teacher to provide either direct instruction to pre-K students or coaching of the provider's staff or both until the 2023-2024 school year. And after that, um, private programs move to the direct instruction of pre-K students. So the coaching is the extra piece that, um, that private providers would have a three-year window to take advantage of. Instead of direct, right? What? Instead of direct teaching, coaching. Coaching. Three year. And then we go on to list two yeah. different possibilities of language to define what coaching is. So in the first instance, we're kind of cross-referencing an AOE pol policy. And in the second instance, we're coming up with our own definition to put in law. So first, a private pre-K provider that uses the services of a qualified teacher to provide instructional coaching to the provider staff 
shall use for this purpose the guidelines for implementing effective coaching systems issued by AOE in March of 2016. So that's one option, and then the alternative option, as used in this section, coaching means the practice of endeavoring to close the student achievement gap and accelerate learning for all students by building teacher capacity through implementation of effective instructional practices, including the provision of ongoing embedded non-evaluative professional learning. So, um, 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 language taken from the March 2016 AOE uh, policy. So um, I'm looking at section eight, which is the effective dates, and as it references se section seven, I guess what I'm not sort of understanding, and maybe it's just different ways of doing it. We have two sections that um, really don't don't start until 2023 or 2024. So why don't we just delay the implement? What is different, um, I guess, rather than just saying effective dates and then saying whatever 16 BSA, whatever that is, is 2023. Oh, so, so, so. Uh, I mean, is there, you don't have to explain the reasons yeah. of the education committee. Yeah. Is there a drafting thing that these are actually, yeah. that doesn't make sense? Yeah, so seven talks about, we just, we just talked about seven, um, the, the phasing basically of this uh, for a teaching uh, obligation. I think it's going to affect like now to let them know that they've got three years basically to, to um, come into compliance. So that takes effect on passage. While the earlier sections about splitting the um, oversight takes effect a year from now, it gives them time to adjust their rulemaking through their rules. Um, so I guess I don't, un I, I just don't understand drafting or whatever, how, why we couldn't just say that those two sections, 16 BSA, 829C1A, blah, blah, will be in effect. August 2023 and the other whatever it is or whether the adding of this whether there has to be this coaching thing I see what you're saying carve that one section out um, I mean, and then and then add it in so have a separate section that amends so then you're amending the same section twice um, versus putting it in session law so I mean we could do it that way um, he, what it would look like is amending section 829 and section one with a particular effective date and then amending it again in section two to have the inclusion of the language we're talking about and then put um, a different effective date for that. So, so this current law does not, well I'll figure that out, we'll talk because I'm probably not understanding this, what current law is versus what we're trying to, what's different now in terms of <clears throat> oh, I see what you're meaning. So right now, it talks about training and supervision instead of direct instruction and coaching. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That was that was the word that came to mind. There will not be a test. There will not be a test. <laughs> you promise. I promise there will not be a test, and we all. Oh, Kelly, a great deal of things um, for sitting down. She's going to be um, um, I mean, it is quarter of five now, so I don't think we have a lot of um, ability to talk more. But maybe um, just if there are questions or um, that maybe one, you know, either we bring folks up here again not questions of, of drafting, but questions that we want to understand more about why, um, that either we pass on to Kelly to, as the 12th member of the education committee around this, or whatever. Or we, do we just need to regurgitate for a while? Ponder. I have a lot of questions. Yeah, you yeah. do. Right. But I have a lot of questions. Right. Right. Providers and everybody, but I don't know. Yeah. Until we have final language, it's kind of hard to say, right? 
So I guess my question is kind of if, if the bill is going to officially come to us at some point, that's one thing. And if it's drive by, um, would it be more appropriate for that drive by to happen after education is made, whatever changes to this language they're going to? Um, um, I'll try to get even more clear. My understanding when we, this whole thing started was that we would, just like we're going to get the right. recovery home bill, that we will take possession. That we will take possession. Okay. But uh, bringing a list of questions downstairs at this point <coughs> is still helpful. Yeah. And so maybe what I would ask folks to do is, is as we think of, no, as we ponder this and think about the questions. questions. And in particular, focusing on the questions about how it will, we have a mixed delivery system, and so um, how how this will, how these changes will impact that, and um, mm -hmm. and 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 do do good. How's that for an English teacher? That's pretty good. Um, for the kids, yeah. I think it's time for the class to be this. I think it's so time. It is so time. You know, why didn't anyone have our meetings today? We were sorry. <laughs> um, so thank you both yeah, very, very much. Yeah, that was very, really, that was very really helpful. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because we really had to start from. And thank you um, for starting us with what's current. Mm -hmm.